Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Saturday, June 23rd, 2018. This is episode 1499. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Simply Safe. Protect your home and family with an A plus home security system. To learn more about Simply Safe today, visit simplysafe.com slash twit. And by Wink. The best way to discover new wines you will love. Go to trywink.com slash tech guy and get $20 off your first shipment. And by LastPass. Join over 33,000 businesses and start managing and securing your company's passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Wow, time to talk computers, the internet. Home theater, digital photography, we got your smartphones, we got your smart watches, we got your augmented reality, all that stuff. 8888-ASK-LEO is uh, my phone number if you want to talk high tech. 888-827-5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you can still reach me. All you have to do is, uh, is call uh, that number from uh, Skype or something like that. 8888-ASK-LEO. Skype out should uh, get you the... Get you where you want to be, and it should be continue to be toll free. Apple has uh, relented. I'm I'm happy to see on the sticky keys. <laughs> they didn't want to admit it, uh, probably because they're worried about the expense. But uh, they are acknowledging now a small percentage of the new MacBooks, the ones with the butterfly keys, a small percentage. Maybe have a little bit of a problem. And if you're experiencing, let, let me read it exactly. Uh, today we launched a keyboard service program for our customers that covers a small percentage, small, un underline that, small percentage of keyboards in certain MacBook and MacBook Pro models, which may exhibit one or more of the following behaviors. Letters or characters that repeat unexpectedly or don't appear when pressed, or keys that feel sticky or aren't responding in a consistent manner. <laughs> Apple's facing not one, not two, but three class action lawsuits over these uh, keyboards. If you have any of the uh, new Apple computers, Apple laptops with the uh, those really short travel butterfly keys, that would be a MacBook from 2015, 16, or 17, a MacBook Pro, from 2016, 17, uh, then you can bring it in and they'll fix it for free. And if you already paid for uh, repairs, which can be quite pricey if you're not not in warranty anymore, up to seven hundred dollars, uh, they'll refund it. Good news. Good news. So uh, I'm glad that they finally admitted this. They took, you know, this is kind of par for the course. Most companies are slow to admit manufacturing defects. Um, but, you know, uh, there comes a time when you just have to acknowledge it and fix it and move on. And Apple can afford to do that. So that's good. So if you have a sticky, uh, you know, the, the problem with these keys, you know, if you have uh, almost any other computer and a crumb gets under there, which it does, I mean, let's face it, people eat. They probably shouldn't, but they eat while they're using their laptops and stuff gets, falls in and gets under there and, Normally, you could just pry it off with a screwdriver, or blow it out, and put it, pop the key back on. It's a fairly easy thing to do. You can't do it with these butterfly keys, and you can't really uh, blow air even under them. <clears throat> and so, it ain't a small percentage. I would say, <laughs> I would say just anecdotally, and of course, anecdotally means just people have told me, but I would say about half the people who have these keyboards are having problems of some kind with them. It's a, it's a problem. And Apple, I hope, redesigns it. I, I had uh, you know a MacBook, 15-inch uh, MacBook Pro from that from 2016, and uh, with the Touch Bar, 
couldn't, I couldn't live with it. So I sent that back and uh, got the 13-inch without the touch bar. Same problem. I had the MacBook, the little butterfly. I couldn't, can't type with it. So I went back, and Apple still sells them, interestingly, to the 2015 15-inch MacBook Pro with a nice, squishy keyboard. <laughs> and that's great, and I love it. And I wish they'd update it because it's now, you know, pretty old fourth-generation Intel processor. That's four generations ago. Um, but, you know, the truth is Intel hasn't really made that many big changes anyway in its processors, and I don't think it's that slow compared to the modern uh, processors. So it's dual-core, not quad-core. Maybe that makes a difference. In any event, I, I think it's a... Uh, I think it's somebody in the chat room saying, this is not a defect. Well, it's a defect. No, it is a defect. Some have decided they do not like the keyboard. They just feel the need to rant endlessly. Well, I admit, I don't like the keyboard. I never had the defect because I got rid of the thing right away. But believe me, <laughs> I've talked to far too many people with non-functioning keyboards to think that it is not a defect. There is clearly a problem. And we know now there is. Apple has admitted it. So I don't know what you're, I don't know what you're talking about. It, they've admitted it. We, we, I think we now know how uh, the FBI got into that uh, Apple iPhone from the, the tragedy in Bakersfield. Uh, a researcher has now figured out a way that uh, even on an iPhone uh, as recent as running 11.3, which is everything but the most recent update, is easily uh, opened up <clears throat> when connected to a computer. You just connect it up and you can try as many passcodes as you want. You know that thing where you say after 10 times erase the phone, that doesn't do anything? You can just keep doing it. Uh, and admittedly, you can't do it super fast. So we have a four-digit passcode with 10,000. That's 9999 plus, I guess, 0000. With 10,000 choices, take about a day. The researcher says, now, if you have six, and six, by the way, is the default on the current uh, iPhones. If you have six, yeah, it's not practical. It's going to take much, much longer. So there's something, a lesson in there for you. If you want to keep bad guys, more good guys, if you want to keep people out of your iPhone, uh, have a six-digit passcode, or better yet, a real passphrase, which is a pain, I understand. But between fingerprint and face ID, you know, you most of the time you're not entering it. I have a, I don't know, 15 or 16 character, I can't remember, it's long, uh, passphrase lock in the iPhone, and that works. that works quite well. I'm happy with that. Here's also some good news for privacy advocates. The U.S. Supreme Court on Friday ruled that uh, a common practice in law enforcement <clears throat> is not constitutional. Uh, all the major cell phone carriers have had special websites, portals they call them, for law enforcement to go and find out the location of any cell phone at any time, historic information, for about a buck fifty. Literally, about a buck fifty, but it happens so much that it's actually a nice little profit center for these companies. There's even other companies that collect all this information. It came up because uh, there was a, a case against somebody uh, who had robbed, or was accused of, I should say, robbing uh, convenience stores. And the way they, the only evidence they had that he was the guy is they got uh, 18 months of cell phone location records. And said every time there was a robbery, the guy was in the area. Every time. And the jury convicted him. He appealed. And uh, on Friday, the Supreme Court ruled in his favor. They're going to send it back to the lower court. So he's not off the hook. But uh, they, they said you can't, you, you can't uh, get cell phone location data without a warrant. Chief Justice uh, Roberts wrote, mapping a cell phone's location over the course of 127 days, I'm sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't 18 months, it was a, four months, 127 days, provides an all-encompassing record of the holder's whereabouts. As with GPS information, the time-stamped data provides an intimate window into a person's life, revealing not only his particular movements, but through them his familial, political, professional, religious, and sexual associations. Wow. Wow. Uh, Kennedy, Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch dissented. It was a close vote. Good news, though. Good news. Law enforcement will need a warrant. That seems fair. A warrant to get that location information. Technology companies had urged, like Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Verizon, Twitter, and Google, had urged the court to protect that data. So I guess Verizon <laughs> didn't want to do it anymore. 
there you go. So some, some good news and bad news in the privacy realm and for keyboards. Uh, thank you for being here today. We're going to take your calls in just a little bit. 8888-ASK-LEO. That is the phone number, 888-827-5536. I'd love to hear from you. We do have a website you can always refer to if you uh, if you would like to, to, to figure out uh, what's going on with the show. Don't feel like you have to write everything down. Just go to techguylabs.com. All right, we're going to go to the phones. Kim Schaffer's here. She's ready. First, uh, first tech guy of the summer. So we're all wearing shorts, right? Or, or something. <laughs> Your call's next. <laughs> We're going to have hot music today, right, Kim Schaffer? Because it's the first tech guy of the summer. And it's going to be 100 here. So. And it's going to be 100, which in Northern California is scary because we're not really We're not used to used it. Used to it. <laughs> we're not really prepared. Yeah. Prepared for it. But we're dressed for it, aren't we? We are. We're in our summer best. Our summer best. <laughs> and uh, you've been slaving over a hot phone in this hot heat, getting callers ready for us. Do you well, have... It's really very air-conditioned in here. <laughs> Actually, yeah, it's too cold often. I know. I've seen I'll you wear a blankets. I'll by the end of the show, and <laughs> yeah. then I'll have to go out yeah. there and defrost. So. Yeah. Who should I uh, start with here? How about Terry and Amarillo uh, having problems with his parallels running windows? Okay. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Terry. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Good to talk to you again. Nice to speak with you. I have a uh, MacBook Air, and I uh, have parallels on it, and I installed Windows 7, and at the right time when they were offering it, I upgraded to Windows 10. Well, the parallels completely crashed and not only took the parallels, but it also took down the Mac, and so I had to what? start over. No, that's not possible. What happened? Did, tr did trash the drive? It, it did. Yeah, it I don't. Did. I don't. Well, I mean, I guess it's. I shouldn't say it's not possible. It's highly unlikely. It, it was during a parallels update, and uh, whenever it's running, well, it went to a blank screen and it stayed there for twelve hours. And so, you know, I thought, well, anyway. Uh, so I started over, and whenever I installed Windows on the the new setup uh, under parallels. It's now wanting me to pay for it again. Huh. <laughs> yeah, because the way I get, I'm guessing that the way uh, Parallels, we should explain, I'll explain uh, briefly what's going on here. Parallels, which is uh, a, a virtual machine program for Macintosh. Uh, there's Parallels, which uh, may have been one of the first, and then VMware, which is the, you know, the granddaddy of VM machines, makes one also called Fusion. <clears throat> but the idea is you run Parallels, and then you can install another operating system into uh, a Parallels and run it while you're running your Mac. So you have your Mac, and then you have a Windows machine or a Unix machine or a Linux machine or a variety, or even older versions of Mac OS. Sometimes people use it for that. Uh, parallels, the way Parallels works, as you know, is it creates a – instead of uh, – in order to simulate a hard drive, everything's simulated on the Windows machine – so it becomes an intermediary between your network card and your hard drive and all this stuff. And, and what it does is it creates a file, a single file, that is the Windows machine, the image of the Windows machine. And that's the drive and everything. That's why it's unlikely the parallels in its normal operation would trash your Mac because it's, just, it's not operating on your whole Mac, just on a file. However, uh, when you do an update to parallels, it does install, I'm sure... A, an extension, probably a, a kernel extension or KXT file, um, in order to work. And I suspect that's the problem. It also, uh, when you license it, uh, a lot of programs do this. It, it probably puts down a hidden file somewhere, or maybe even not a hidden file, in, uh, in the, uh, you know, the application support folder, somewhere like that, that says, yeah, this is registered, here's the serial number, this is the owner. So if you, re if you reformat the drive, yeah, you're going to have to re-register parallels um but uh, so you're saying it wants to re-register parallels not windows right oh uh, parallels works just fine it's oh. just the window and well yeah so. you're you've lost your vm probably did you lose the whole vm yes yeah so you have to reinstall windows as you did in the you know in the first place you've that that installs into a single file i'm <clears throat> i'm not sure it seems pretty bad 
to crash your system. I hope that it's not just a coincidence. Sometimes people often say, uh, oh, yeah, this I installed something and my system crashed because of it. But it, it might have been merely that the system was, you know, on its last legs and that just pushed it over the edge. Should parallel, nothing you should do when you install parallel should really cause a problem. So you, uh, when you installed your Windows 10 on parallels, uh, did you uh, have a license key in the first place, or did you start with Windows 7? I started with Windows 7, so yeah. You up, I get it. You upgraded 7 to 10. That's right. Yeah, so you'll need to do the same. Unfortunately, you'll need to do the same steps. Windows 10 on regular hardware, you wouldn't need to you know, relicense it. But, it. but because you've really, in effect, lost the hardware, this has always been kind of an interesting question, is if I register Windows to a parallels virtual machine, lose the virtual machine and start over. Wouldn't it be the same machine? I, you know, I don't think, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, Windows 10 says, I don't recognize this machine, right? That's right. Yeah. So I think what you're going to have to do is, I hate to say this, is install Windows 7 on the virtual machine. Use that Windows 7 license key that you have. Okay. That should work because it looks the same to Windows 7 and then upgrade to Windows 10. And then from now on, what you want to do is back up the VM file. So uh, Parallels uh, creates a folder in your, uh, in your system, on your, in your local heart, you know, uh, home directory, uh, called, I think called Virtual Machines, but something like that. <clears throat> and then in that folder would be a file that says Windows 10, or maybe it'll say Windows 7 because that's what you're going to start with. Make a copy of that. That's that's actually the entire PC. So you can copy that onto something else and keep it, and then you'll never have to do this again. You'll have to go through it again. Um, so I'm sorry that that happened. I've had good results with Parallels. I use tem tend to use VMware Fusion now. It's really a kind of a clever way of doing things. There's one more interesting slice on this. Uh, both Parallels and VMware Fusion will uh, recognize a boot camp partition. So another thing you could do, maybe a thing to think about, if you using boot camp means that you'll boot into Windows and it, there'll be no Mac, no traces of Mac left. You'll be running Windows on Mac hardware, which runs fine, provided you have the drivers from Apple. So if you used boot camp to create a Windows partition on your Mac, you'd have that option to boot into Windows when you first start up. But also these virtual machines will see it and say, "Oh, you have a boot you have Windows on a boot camp partition. You want me to use that for virtualization?" The advantage of that is uh, then the license for Windows 10 will be permanent because it'll be licensed to your computer. So you'll have to, if you if for some reason you format your drive, you'll have to reinstall boot camp, but you won't have this same issue of having to run Windows 7 first and then run Windows 10. And you'll have an additional advantage that when you do want to run Windows at full speed, virtualization, running in a virtual machine, has some overhead, so it's a little slower. But if you wanted to run at full speed, maybe to run a game or something that really required all the horsepower of the Mac, running it in boot camp uh, is a great solution. So you, then you get the best of both worlds. That's, that's typically how I, uh, how I do it. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. You know, Microsoft does charge for Windows 10, oddly enough. But if you're upgrading from Windows 7, it's uh, it's free. And I think you can still upgrade. I think in this case, you could still do the upgrade. Actually, that's an interesting question, too. Anybody have any experience with that? 8888 Ask Leo. Scott Wilkinson, Home Theater Guru, coming up. That's an actually now that's a now that I think of it, I'm pretty sure it will still activate, right? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. There you go, that magic music <laughs> signals the arrival in his funk mobile, <laughs> accompanied with the funkettes, Scott Get Wilkinson. Down. <laughs> Our home theater guru. Funky. He is the funkiest tuba player in the world. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Uh, uh, editor at the AVS Forum. And uh, he joins us each week to talk about home theater, audio, and video. I just was mentioning that I got this uh, Amazon Fire TV Cube. Do you have yeah. you ever used the Fire TV? I, that's one I have not tried. No, yeah, I've we've used, used the, the Roku stick yeah. and the Apple TV yeah. and 
so on. But I've never tried Fire TV, and uh, I don't yet have the uh, the Cube. I saw that last week, the announcement that it was available. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I must admit, I've always been a little squeamish about any device that kind of listens. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's listening uh, to everything you're doing in yeah. the TV room. Yeah. Uh, because it's an echo. It's an echo. It's an echo. It I don't have an echo. Supports 4K, HDR10, mm -hmm. and Atmos, mm. which is kind of wow. cool. Not Dolby. Uh, Not Dolby Vision. Vision but uh, I wonder about HLG. Doesn't mention that's HLG. <clears throat> that's the, the other high dynamic range format that uh, the World Cup. Some some sources are providing that uh, World Cup in HDR with using oh. HLG. Oh, interesting. Well, the idea so, of this is it's a Fire TV that you control with your voice, and it's kind of cool. Right. I mean, I, I set it up in my uh, office, and it's kind kind of cool because you can go into the office, and say, turn on the TV, or you can even better say, uh, let's watch Westworld. Right. Echo, watch Westworld. It's a little, you know, funny, and I'm sure Michael have the same experience because what it then does is it searches for Westworld. It has built into it uh, Netflix, of course, and Amazon. Mm -hmm. Prime and uh, Amazon, yep. all the Amazon music, and all the Amazon stuff. And then right. you can add, as I did, HBO Go or HBO Now. You can add Showtime anytime. Mm -hmm. So I have HBO uh, Now on there. And uh, so I said, uh, let watch Westworld. And what it'll do is then looks throughout its database of stuff and says, oh, there's two Westworlds. There's the movie, the old Yul Brynner movie. 1970s, yeah. <laughs> and then there's the TV show. And then it puts up on the screen. It uses the screen. Puts up on the screen, and then you're supposed to say play one or play two. Right. So it takes a few steps. You, if you ask for the weather, it puts a weather report up on the screen. Sure. Yeah. Sure. You can watch NBC and CBS if you have an account with them and mm -hmm. stuff like that. You, you mean the live, the streaming ones? Uh, yeah, it's on demand. I don't think they have live. And that's yeah, been the problem demand. all along is that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, no, if you want to replace TV, I didn't see YouTube. YouTube's not on here. I didn't see YouTube TV, which would give me live TV. Right. Um, it has Hulu. Um, so, you know, you can control Netflix with it, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But it, I like the idea. And then when you leave the room, this is my favorite part. You could say, Echo, turn off the TV and the whole thing shuts down. Shuts I have it down. hooked up yeah. through my uh, AV receiver. So it has it's it's got a IR blaster all around. It's a cube, mm. so it fires infrared out from the hole. And there's even a little attachment, so you can put an IR blaster. Wow! Below. So it fires out IR commands in all directions, yeah. sort of. Yeah, but it doesn't so control the Apple TV or the Roku. It could, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It's just trying to replace them. Right. That's probably the point. But it does record my AV receiver. And it does record my uh, control my TV, and that control was fairly easy to set up. Yeah, you know, I've read an article recently about how many things from Star Trek are now real. Yeah, this is one, and that's one of computer. them. Computer, working, yes. working. <laughs> <laughs> so Voice this control is really amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, like you say, some people don't want anything listening in the in the house. Uh, don't I forget, though, squeamish your phone it. is also listening, but uh, we won't. We I don't want to trouble you. So. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> so, so we'll just move on. You Let's wanted to right talk on. about sound bars, and we get, boy, I would say of all the AV stuff that we talk about, that's the yep. number one topic. Yep, I, that and TVs, I bet. Yeah. Well, t everybody wants to know about TVs, but for some reason, people are really, because TVs today don't come with very good sound, or some some don't even come with sound at all, so yeah, you need something, yeah. and a lot of people don't really want to. Yeah, they don't want to put in five or seven speakers. Mm -hmm. So a soundbar can do it all, right? Can it do Atmos? Somebody asked me last week. Yes, it can. There are a number of soundbars that will do Atmos, and that does it in this reflective way, right? We've talked about this before, where Atmos, as you know, is uh, speakers around you or sound sources around you and overhead forming a, a fully hemispherical sound field so if a helicopter flies overhead you f you hear it flying overhead now in the movie theater that really works it's very oh powerful. yeah it's phenomenal but, uh, but how well does the sound speakers up there. yeah right they've got big speakers up there big speakers and a bunch of them yeah uh it, at home you can do at most unless you have a super expensive system you can do at most four speakers overhead 
But even if, but say you have a, a, a domestic partner who doesn't want you to put speakers on the ceiling. Yeah. Uh, you can do it by reflecting sound, by having separate speakers that are sort of sitting on top of your regular speakers that, that uh, push sound up to the ceiling that reflects back down to you. And it sounds like it's coming from overhead. Sound bars can do this as well because they have drivers, little speaker elements that vibrate. Uh, they have drivers in them that set, that send sound straight toward you as normal speakers would. But they also have drivers that point upward and bounce the sound off the ceiling and it comes back down to you and it sounds like something's coming from overhead. And uh, there are quite a few companies that make them. Uh, uh, LG has a couple. Um, Philips, not so com not so common in this country. Uh, Samsung, very common in this country. Sony, uh, Yamaha has a number of them. How well Vizio do they does. work, though? I mean, uh, it's surprisingly well. Okay, okay. It's amazing, actually. Now you're only getting basically two channels of overhead sound, um, which is less effective than if you have four channels of overhead. Sound. Oh, I didn't know you could do four. Okay, you can, yeah. In fact, the latest, uh, I think it's the latest Denon flagship receiver will let you do six Ooh. overhead speakers. Ooh. And that's the first time that's happened. Now, that's an expensive product. That's several thousand dollars just for the receiver. Then, then you, you got to buy, buy speakers. six speakers. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Right, exactly. Wow. Uh, but a sound bar, as you point out, and rightly so, is intended for people who don't want to mess with a bunch of speakers but want better sound than is coming from their TV. Right. And and virtually any sound bar will do that. And a number of these now have this Atmos feature where you have two channels anyway going up as well as channels coming straight at you. Uh, and even simulating as if, as if they're coming from beside you or even a little behind you. It's amazing what DSP, digital signal processing, can do. They're tricking your trick ears. You. Yes, yes, really interesting. exactly so. Yeah. Yeah. They're tricking your ears into thinking you've got a sound coming from side over here to the side or a little behind you even. And then they're using this reflective technology to give you the sense of sounds coming from overhead. And uh, it, it's remarkably effective. Well, all right. Is there one that you really like that every, I mean, that's not too expensive, but uh, people well, should Well, I, I generally, for an not very expensive ones, I generally recommend Vizio. And my colleague Mark Henninger just published his review of, of a Vizio soundbar on AVS Forum. It doesn't have Atmos, but it's only a couple hundred bucks. Wow. So uh, that might, that's a good op option if you don't have decent sound in your TV, but you don't. Exactly, you which 99.99% <laughs> of people with TVs don't have decent sound in yeah. their TVs. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, a, a soundbar is the next step up, and it's a big step up. Now, the step beyond that, of course, is an audio video receiver and speakers all around. But if you don't want to go that route, soundbar is great. That's the solution we we like, but not everybody <laughs> can do. Scott Wilkinson, as always, a pleasure. If you want to know more, avsforum.com. Scott's always got great reviews and articles. And he joins us each week at this time to help you better understand your home theater options. Thank you, Scott. You bet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls coming up right after this. And now I give you <clears throat> your, your buddy in ours, 250 seconds of Scott Ooh, Wilkinson. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Beatmaster says, yes, some wives wouldn't approve of more than a sound bar. You're exactly right. That's exactly correct. And it's mostly wives. I tend to say spouse or domestic partner or whatever because... Who knows? Maybe the female of the house, uh, if there is a female in the house, might be the tech person who wants all the latest gadgetry. But statistically speaking, probably not. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see. WP788 says it's not surround, but my TV basically has a built in two channel sound bar. Yeah, there are a few like that and they can sound not too bad. You know, it's interesting. I just finished reviewing the LG C8 2018 uh, next to the very lowest end or entry level OLED TV. And the sound of that thing was surprisingly good. 
Uh, the other one that I can think of that the sound is really good is the Sony OLED. And that uses a really interesting technology that I've, I'm sure I've spoken about before, which is the entire screen, that is the OLED screen, the TV screen that you're watching, is also the speaker. It actually vibrates. It has actuators behind the screen that vibrate, and the entire screen becomes the speaker. It sends sound waves out to, into the room, and you'd think well, wait a second, I should be able to see that. Wouldn't that de degrade the picture? Not at the frequencies that it's reproducing, which are relatively high. Uh, you, it also come, it also has a built-in quote-unquote subwoofer, which isn't really a subwoofer, but it's for the low frequencies, and that doesn't vibrate the screen. Uh, if, it were, if you did have the screen try to reproduce the low frequencies, uh, you would see that, and it would not be good. So Sony wisely... Uh, decided to only let the screen do the mid-range and up and higher frequencies uh, because you can't see it. And the, the quality is amazing. It's really something. Now, Sony started doing that last year with the uh, what's called the A1E. This year, they've upped that model number to the A8F. And like some TVs, Vizio in particular, that, that last letter indicates the model year. So with Vizio TVs, we are now up to F. So you'll see in Vizio TVs, you'll see a P55-F1 or F2. And those, those numbers after the letter indicate uh, firmware updates, uh, roughly. <clears throat> so, you know, you'll see an E55C1. Marsworm in the chat room was talking about uh, whether or not to fix his a Vizio C55, uh, uh, oh no, it was a P55, a P55-C1. So that's from 2015. Uh, and he said he could get it fixed for 350 bucks. And I said in the chat room, well, if you, you know, if, yeah, if, okay, that's less than probably most TVs would cost. Some are down there now, but you know, you you might want to consider spending that money towards a newer TV because the 2015, was it even 4K, Marsworm? I'm asking you. Uh, what, I don't remember if the C1 is 4K or 1080p. Um, the P series is, is the best of the Vizios, in my opinion. And so uh, if you can upgrade to a P55F1, that is this year's model, uh, I'm sure it'll be a significant upgrade uh, to what you have. And I think it's worth uh, spending the money on the upgrade there. Stick around for the top of the hour. Happy to. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ESK. Leo, I'll do a more thorough review, I guess, of the uh, Amazon Q. But, I like, you know, if you're a Fire TV customer, this might be a, or thinking about a Fire TV, this might be a good option for you. $120, I didn't mention that. It's much more expensive than a... Amazon Fire TV. Same capabilities, except that you have an Amazon Echo associated with it, so you can use the Echo to control the Fire TV. And I like it that it will turn on the TV set, and it turns on my AV receiver, so uh, it, you know, can all, and, and sets it to its proper channel, so it can automatically kind of turn on the TV and go to something. That's kind of handy. I like talking to my TV. There's another option. We, we've talked about it before. Where actually, I like quite a bit called the... Uh, Harmony Hub, the Logitech Harmony Hub, that also is an infrared device. And it, actually, you can control the hub via your Amazon Echo. So if you already have an Echo and you want to control, you don't need a Fire TV or you already have a Fire TV or you don't want a Fire TV, but you do want to control the other stuff in your, uh, in your you know, video cabinet, the Harmony Hub is actually a pretty good choice for that. And it's a little more flexible in terms of the kinds of things. I think it's 100 bucks, so it's roughly the same price. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number if you want to talk high-tech. High-tech means a lot, right? <laughs> TVs, remote controls, but also computers, the Internet. Uh, anything with a chip in it, I guess. Richard West LA is next. Actually, he has a question for you, Scott. Hi, Richard. Hi, Leo. Thanks for taking this because it's important to me, All right. maybe to others. Let me get Scott on the uh, horn here. Go ahead. You there, Scott? I sure am. All right. Hey, Scott. I hey. have a video TV uh, on your recommendation, and I'm very pleased with it in general. However, mm -hmm. uh, it worked very well for about a 
year and a half, and all of a sudden, when I tune on Direct TV 104, it tells me that my TV is not capable of receiving uh, uh, 4K, which is nonsense because it's been receiving 4K for a year and a half. Do you know anything about that? Boy, no, I don't. And it works. It works uh, on other channels. Oh, it's uh, no 4K on other channels. 104 is the 4K well, channel for Direct yeah, TV, uh, you know, uh, and 105 TV. and 106 too, I think. Right, and you're you're wanting to watch the World Cup, I assume. Yep. Yeah, well, exactly. Of things have passed by. So, yeah, sure. uh, you know, when when uh, so what's happening here is, it's, uh, in my opinion, a handshake issue because uh, the Direct TV box is is querying the TV and saying. Right. Hey, can you do 4K? Uh, right. Uh, it, now, oddly, you'd say, well, you used to do it, but it doesn't have any memory. So it has to ask <laughs> right. that every single time. Yeah. And for some reason, there's... Uh, I, Scott, you see that... I would imagine you see this a lot. Hand, HDMI handshaking issues. That is what, That is a big problem. Now, did it used to work is, was the next question I was going to ask. Have you ever gotten 4K from that channel? For a year and a half, yes. You, yes, okay. So... Something changed. Yeah. Well, <laughs> something could have gone wrong. Um, right. Or there might have been an automatic firmware update that, that messed something up. I would first, uh, uh, first thing I would, months. yeah, first thing I'd do is replace the cable. That's a good, that's a good point. Although, again, if it's the same cable, if nothing has changed and it used to work and now it doesn't, I would think it's not the cable. Uh, however, that's certainly a, an inexpensive and easy thing to try. And just make sure that you have a cable that is certified high speed. Uh, and by high speed these days with HDMI, we mean 18 gigabits per second. And I just recently got some, there, there are certified cables that do that on Amazon. I think uh, uh, Cable Matters might be the brand. I can't remember now. But it was like 10 bucks for, for a six foot cable. So it wasn't that expensive. And it was certified. Uh, please. Yeah, sure. I've, I have called DirecTV over the last <clears throat> month and a half, and they have told me it's a known issue. That's why oh. I'm, calling. I'm glad to oh. talk to you. Oh, it what's the issue? In my system. Did they say what the known issue is? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> so all that means is, uh, yeah, other people have been calling about this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, now, now I presume you got me curious. I presume you've done all the handshaking stuff. Turn the TV off, turn the box off, then turn the TV on, then turn the box on, and try various orders and all of that stuff. Because that's yeah. innumerable times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Getting sick of it, I'm sure. Yeah, sounds like uh, there might be a flaw in the Direct TV box if it's a yeah. The, it known it problem. might have gotten a, a firmware update that screwed things up. Yeah. It's possible. Well, they seem to know it's an issue, and they know my system. I, you know, they install the boxes, obviously. Yeah. And, they, and when I asked about that, I said, do I need a new box? No, I'm not talking to the top rank of customer service, obviously. Not yet, when I, anyway. When they, they created a ticket, they said, for the upper echelons, and they said that they would inform me would, if something changes. And, of course, I've heard zero, uh, nothing at all. And when was so your I'm last contact you, with them? You've heard of it before. When was your last contact with them? Uh, let me think. About 10 days ago. Mm. Which box I do you have? have? Which box do you I have could, so people can... Uh, Make a note. The genie. Of this. The genie, okay. The genie, yeah, that's what you need. The genie or the genie 2 to get the World Cup in 4K HDR, which on Direct TV uses HLG. What's your TV? It's a Vizio, I think, right? The Vizio, yeah, the one you recommended yeah. a couple of years ago, in fact. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Does it, the does it support HLG, Scott? I oh, mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yes, without a doubt. Okay. For a year and a half, I was watching all sorts of programs on it. And they probably look great. Oh yes, I have. I'm totally pleased, and congratulations to you. And I'm not going <laughs> to it in for the latest, by the way. Yeah, I, I, well. I wonder if this is a World Cup issue. Can you watch that stuff on 105 and 106? I've tried them all. Okay. 104, 5, and 6 before the World Cup even started, and I kept getting this message at the okay. bottom of the screen: "Your TV, TV does not support 4K. Yeah, and we're going to give it to you in 1080." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, now you've got me curious. I'm going to contact DirecTV myself and say, uh, what's the deal with this? And see if I can you find would. out. And if I can, I'll I'll talk about it next week. G okay, and I will be listening next week. I'll be very <laughs> Given that they know it's a it's a known issue, Richard, yeah, exactly. can you get them to send you a new box? Or have they said they won't do that? 
Oh, I didn't, I, frankly, I didn't ask that because the way they put it was it wasn't just my box. It sounded like it was system wide and they're working on oh. it. Oh. Et cetera, et cetera. Well, they're probably I getting a lot of calls then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that no, World Cup's yeah. pretty popular on the television. Yeah, that's what they say. Well, it's yeah, been happening it's a firmware, well before yeah. the World Cup started. Yeah. It started about a month and a half ago before the World Cup began. Yeah, but the, uh, but the calls started <laughs> a week ago. World Cup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All they might have started a month ago, and they might have started getting a few calls, but yeah. once the World Cup began, I'm sure their call volume went oh, way up. Very interesting. You may not be able to get through, Scott, even you. Yeah. Well, um, we'll see. I, I've got some contacts in there. So you know, I'll with see. any okay, luck. Thank you. I'll listen next week for sure. Good. And, and sure. let us know, too, if it, if it starts working, Richard, because I wouldn't be surprised. They could push in a, a firmware update. And if there's a if there's exactly. a firmware glitch, it sounds like maybe an incompatibility, then they could probably push something that would fix that out. Yeah. And, in fact, go to avsforum.com uh, and look around. There might be other people with that issue, who are, and they're talking about it on the forum. Yeah. Did they say, just one more question, uh, Richard, did they say it was a known issue with that particular TV, or... No. No. A known issue. Known issue in general with DirecTV. Which yeah. means it's their box yeah. or their, their yeah. system somewhere. They're having, a, they're having a problem. No, they. I gave them all the information they needed because, obviously, that was something of interest to me. And, yeah. and they know what I have. They know better than How I know what I have. Yeah, because you really... I The World Cup is so exciting, and you do want to see oh, it before yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can't because I don't have the right hardware, but those of you who do, I mean, of course you're going to want to see that. I bet, I bet you they get a lot of calls this weekend. <laughs> Yeah. Well, hey. but it's not just this weekend. It's been going on since this. No, I understand. The started, what, five days ago? Yeah. They, the call started before yeah. then. Yeah. By the hey. way, uh, I'm looking at the chat room. Scooter X is saying, try a different HDMI input. I don't think that'll work. I think we've solved the problem think, that it is I a direct TV problem. I think have done all of that. It's just a yeah. question. Thank you, Scott, for sticking around. I appreciate it. Sure, no all problem. Right. See, it's nice. We can, you know, I, I feel like Woody Allen and... Uh, Annie Hall, I can just pull Marshall McLuhan out of the line and say, well, I happen to have an expert here. <laughs> That's nice. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Back to the phones. More of your calls coming up right after this. I guess there's a lot of uh, traffic on, on the Reddit forums and the DirecTV forums about this. So it is absolutely a, a known <laughs> A known issue, huh, Scott? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's what it sounds like to yeah. me. Yeah. All right, I'll give it to you for 500 seconds. Thank you. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy those 500 seconds as much as I, I will. I always do. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, Scooter X was I, – I tried tried to sneak that in there. Uh, Scooter X was saying that uh, passing on info from DirecTV and Reddit forums uh, regarding – posts about that your TV does not support 4K message. Um, I would, I don't know this for a fact, Scooter X, but I would be willing to wager that uh, that's probably if it happens right away, immediately, uh, when you first hook things up and you get that message, uh, then sure, changing HDMI ports. Another important factor, which I don't think was a, a factor in his case, is Virtually all 4K TVs with HDR capabilities have a switch buried in the menu system. And the switch is off by default. And you have to turn it on in order to get, in order to tell the HDMI inputs, maybe some of them, maybe all of them on the TV, to go to the higher bit rate, 18 gigabits per second. It's off by default in order to make the TV as compatible as possible with other devices, source devices. And some source devices, I guess, I have not run across this myself, but it might be that some source devices, uh, if, they, if they communicate with the TV and the TV says, hey, I can accept 18 gigabits, they go, oh, I can't send 18 gigabits, so I'm gonna, not going to work. Uh, so the switch is turned off and you have to go deep. You have to dig into the menu system and turn it on in order to get 18 gigabits. Now, I don't think that's this guy's problem because it used to work. That's the key. It used to work and now it doesn't. And he hasn't changed anything. And when it used to work and now it doesn't, that indicates to me that something changed. 
And especially after he called DirecTV and they said, oh, this is a known problem, obviously uh, something changed in the DirecTV box. And I would guess it's a firmware update that got pushed out, as uh, DirecTV does, and all, all these companies do, uh, Dish as well and, and so on, that, uh, you know, that, that broke that particular feature. Now they've got to fix it, and I hope they do. Uh, Beatmaster asked, maybe an EDID issue, E-D-I-D, stands for Extended or Enhanced Display Identification. I forget whether it's enhanced or extended, but in any event, uh, that's what it stands for. And it basically is a piece of data coming from the TV. After you make the HDMI handshake, then the TV sends its EDID information back to the source device. And this may be the source of why this... Uh, the switch needs to be off by default that I was talking about a minute ago. The, um, the EDID goes back to the, t to, to the source device and says, here are my capabilities. Um, and so uh, Beatmaster is wondering if it's an EDID issue. I doubt that because, uh, once again, it used to work. That is the critical piece of information. Uh, Ed says, DirecTV just updated their app on my Roku TV, and it's terrible. What? In what way is it terrible, Ed? Uh, that would be kind of interesting. Uh, Scooter X says, some posts say it happens every few weeks. Then there is a software update for DirecTV hardware and one for the TV that fixes it. Okay, so, you know, there's some stuff going on here. Um, <laughs> Emily the Strange. <laughs> Uh, it means that he has a grandson who changed something by setting up a video game on it. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that would be true. Uh, possible, anyway. Um, yeah, Mike Heiss. Uh, hey, Mike, good to see you here. Uh, could be an update they pushed that whacked it. Exactly. That's what I think happened. Uh, Rezarius asks if I'm going to review the new Ant-Man movie. Yes, I am. I'm going... Um, uh, I believe July 5th, uh, the opening night. I have my ticket for Dolby Cinema, and I'm going to go see it. I didn't see Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, which was this weekend. Um, I almost decided to go, and then I thought, eh, you know what? More roaring dinosaurs. Eh, same old, same old. But the Ant-Man movie looks like it could be fun. Uh, Web 0109, uh, is there a significant disadvantage having only HDR versus HDR on an OLED? I'm not sure I know what you mean by that. I'm looking to upgrade my main TV from a 10-year-old 1080p Panasonic Viera Plasma, which is great, which I loved and is, which I agree is great. My budget is $1,000 maximum. I'd like to keep the size at or above 60 inches. Um which, correct me if I'm wrong, rules out an OLED purchase right now. Yeah, 1000 bucks for a 65-inch. You won't get a 60, but you'll get a 65. Uh, yeah, that's not going to happen. OLED's more expensive than that. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't know what you mean by the disadvantage of having only HDR versus HDR on an OLED. I guess you might mean uh, HDR on an LCD TV, um, in which case the, there are differences. OLED gets deeper blacks, LCD TV gets brighter, brighter brights, brighter whites. Sounds like a laundry commercial, I know, but that's what it is. Um, and you probably can, I'm sure you can, get a 65-inch uh, LCD TV with HDR for a 1000 bucks. Uh, some of the Vizios, certainly, TCL, uh, can do it, and so I'd, I'd recommend looking at those in that price range. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, how do, a lawn dog, how do you know if you are receiving 1080p or 4K picture? Is there something that indicates 4K, uh, 4K letting you know you're viewing 4K content? Uh, most TVs have a little thing that pops up in the corner, in my case, on my Sony OLED, it's in the upper right corner, uh, that tells you what the signal is that's coming in. So that's normally how you know. 
Maverick 56. Too many action movies these days. It's getting old with all these Marvel DC comic movies. Yeah, I, I'm not. Uh, that is not an unreasonable position. There are an awful lot of them. Um, I just happen to enjoy them. They're fun, fun for a couple hours. Uh, Marsworm, uh, we've been talking about his Vizio, whether to fix it or not. Uh, TV would, what TV would I recommend for 400 to 450 bucks that could replace it? A 55 inch, maybe one of the lower end Vizios might be at that price. TCL probably. Once again, Vizio or TCL are my two go-to brands for inexpensive, but pretty good quality TVs. Um, so that's about the story there. Um, no, let's not do that. <clears throat> Ed only me only remembers resume after you've watched it. Oh, only remembers. Hmm. Sorry, I don't quite understand what Resume. you mean there, Ed. Resume. Thank you. <laughs> after you've watched 15 minutes of a movie or show. Thank you, Scott. We'll talk about it later. Have a Thanks. great week. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We've got smartphones. We've got smart watches. We've got uh, augmented reality. We've got... Uh, Digital streaming, net neutrality, all the topics of the uh, tech world on this show, and they're all open for discussion. If it has a chip in it, I want to talk with you about it. Our phone number is 888-827-5536. That's 8888-ASK-LEO. See, easy to remember. 8888-ASK-LEO. You can call that toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. If you're calling from outside that area, I'd love to hear from you, but uh, you'll have to use Skype out or something like that to call. 80, that way it'll still be toll-free. 8888-ASK-LEO. Uh, we have a website. Good for you to know about because this way you don't have to write anything down as you hear me talk about stuff and review things or answer questions. Uh, it's all uh, up there at techguylabs.com. Techguylabs. I'm the tech guy. It's my lab.com. <laughs> techguylabs.com. And it's free. There's no sign-up. There's no... It's just, you know, they've got a good search. It's easy to find stuff. And every show is up there, all 1,499. Tomorrow, episode 1,500 of, the, of this ongoing attempt <laughs> to make sense of the technology world. I got a, a Chinese phone. I thought I'd be kind of interesting. You know, there's been all this controversy over ZTE and Xiaomi and Huawei, the big Chinese companies, the consumer electronics companies. And, of course, you may remember that ZTE has been banned from the United States. Uh, Huawei is uh, not banned, but um, uh, hard to find Huawei products uh, because they're made in China. And, uh, and there's this, this kind of prejudice against them. I thought, well, there's a new a newish Huawei phone. Huawei is spelled, by the way. And this is another problem. People can't pronounce dub H-U-A-W-E-I. There's... <laughs> It's perfectly pronounceable if you know Chinese, but if you don't, you just is it Huawei? Hu, hu, hua? It's Huawei. They uh, announced a phone a couple of months ago called the P20 Pro that they did with uh, the German camera company Leica that has a pretty amazing camera in it. And I thought, well, boy, I I'm really interested in uh, in in you know how good camera phones can be. Uh, it's a it's a it's a you know 5.8 inch phone. It's uh, 1080p. It's not the super high resolution of of Samsung's phones, but it's good enough. Great, great battery life. I hear it runs Android, but it runs a special uh, Huawei version of Android called Emui. <laughs> I think that's how you pronounce it, Emui. Uh, and then some people really don't like Emui. But the thing that interests me again was this phone, which is according to DxO Mark the best the camera rather the best camera in a phone they've ever seen. Uh, it has a 20 megapixel monochrome sensor, 12 megapixel RGB sensor, uh, and uh, it has, a tw I think the front facing camera is 25 megapixels. There is a notch, just like on Apple's phone, because it has face recognition. They're using a digital image stabilization, uh, so a, a supposedly very good light, low light mode and so forth. I'm still reviewing the camera. I'm not... Uh, I'm not done with that, but I did want to mention <laughs> something, and in a way, it's uh, to me, it's it's a celebration of how, believe it or not, 
how well we're doing in the United States in protecting privacy, particularly on Apple, but even on uh, Android phones sold by Pixel, by Google, this, the Google Pixel. Uh, so when I s turned on this Huawei P20 phone, I had to buy it from China. It got shipped over from China. Uh, it was ready to go in English, uh, signed in. It's like a regular Android phone, except a couple of things were a little odd. For instance, before even the Android sign in, it, it said, well, we'd like to give you localized weather information. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, but for that, we not only need to track your location, we need to know your phone's unique identifying number, the IMEI, and MAC address. And I thought, really, for the weather? For the weather, you need that? For the weather? And that was just the beginning. I agreed to it. I thought, well, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. Throughout the phone, again and again, there's requests for very personal information, uh, like unique identifying numbers, in, in apps that don't seem to need it. Uh, I was prohibited from signing up for a Huawei account. I don't know if that's U.S. Uh, export restrictions or Huawei's attempt to kind of keep this thing on the up and up in the U.S. I couldn't use Huawei's music feature either. So a number of the uh, apps on the phone are designed for, I guess, China-only use, certainly not in the U.S. anyway. Nevertheless, there was enough in there that made me some, you know, some fairly seriously concerned that this phone really felt like it was gathering a lot of information about me for the Huawei company. Not for the carrier, because it was a carrierless phone. I ended up putting an AT&T SIM in it, but I could have used a T-Mobile SIM as well. It actually has a dual SIM slot, which is nice. You could use both if you wanted to. Um, it's very common in the Chinese market and around the world, but not so much here in the U.S. It's a very nice phone. I, I want to continue to review the camera, but it made me really grateful, frankly, for American manufacturers and companies that sell in America that they are a little bit more, I think, cautious about consumer privacy. Partly that's because we make a lot of noise about it. And as we, as we know, in China, there isn't really that much uh, interest in protecting individual privacy. They've got face recognition everywhere. There's a social credit system that they use to keep people in line. Uh, and, uh, and apparently on this phone, you know, they didn't see anything wrong about asking for all this information. At least they asked me and told me. <laughs> that it, I presume that, uh, well, who knows? I mean, maybe they're doing even more and not asking me about that. So I'm, I'm uh, and, I, and I talked uh, this week, uh, yesterday actually, with the guy who invented pretty good privacy, PGP, back in the, in the 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, in well, it was it was 1991, the 1990s, and uh, he does he lives in Holland now. He's very he's American, but he's very concerned about privacy. He always has been, more concerned now than ever. And uh, I asked him, well, what do you use? He says, I I use only an iPhone. He says, I just I just don't think Android phones. And this, by the way, when I talk to security and privacy researchers everywhere. This is universal. They will not use Android phones. When people go to hacker conventions, they don't take Android phones with them. They don't feel safe. Now, I have to say this Huawei P20 immediately updated to the latest Google patches for Android. That's good. The security patches were in there. It does, at least in the U.S., probably not in China, but at least in the U.S., it does support the Android Play Store, and I was able to get all the Google apps on there and everything. But uh, if, if privacy is a concern... And I know at the beginning of the show, uh, I talked a little bit about uh, what Apple's doing uh, in regards to privacy. They just released an uh, update to iOS that's going to prevent people from accessing your phone via the lightning port. If it hasn't been unlocked in an hour, nobody can plug it in and, and get data out of it or use one of those password cracking uh, tools. I, I have to say, uh, if privacy is a concern... And remember, we put our lives in these phones, not just our location, but everything is in these phones. Um, increasingly, I'm, I'm, I'm of the opinion, while I love Android phones and I love many of the features that Android phones have that iPhones don't, there's nothing like what Apple's doing to protect your privacy. There really isn't. And, um, and increasingly, I, you know, when I look at these, this phone from China, it's like, wow, <laughs> wow, they don't, they don't seem to really worry much about privacy. <laughs> it's, not, 
it's not a concern, I guess. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 88, 88, ask Leo. We don't just take questions, we take answers too. So if you hear something on this show and you say, I know, call, absolutely. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. As long as I'm talking about products, I want to talk about Simply Safe. You know, I can't think, I can't count the number of people we've set up with Simply Safe. Uh, just, I mean, I love Simply Safe. Here, let me show you. I got my new Simply Safe kit here. Ah, this is home security done right. They, they created Simply Safe uh, to make it easier and more affordable for everybody to get the kind of home security you want. You know what? You can get you can go to the wrong person. Then last year, the Better Business Bureau had more than five thousand complaints about alarm companies. In fact, home security, I'm sad to say, is in the top ten percent of most complained about industries. Simply Safe was created to fix that problem. They got rid of contracts. They got rid of hidden fees. They work hard to earn your business, and instead of relying on tricks and fine print, they make an awesome product that's very affordable. A company that relies on good service and great products. How rare is that? Here's our uh, Simply Safe kit. Inside, I've got the base station. I love this new base station, by the way. It's impervious. A plus rating, by the way, with the Better Business Bureau. For 10 years running, 40,000 five star reviews online. Simply Safe is everything home security ought to be, and it is very affordable. Learn more today at simplysafe.com slash twit, simplysafe.com slash twit. Here's the base unit. You cannot destroy this thing. <laughs> you can hit it with a bat. You can cut the phone lines, cut the Wi-Fi. It's still going to phone home. And very affordable, $15 a month monitoring. That's a third what the other guys charge for the same monitoring. Simply say, and you install it yourself, which I kind of like because I don't want some guy traipsing through the house. Every All the sensors, easy to install. I'm making a mess here. This is, uh, let's see, this is the keypad. Also, you can hit that with a bat, no problem. These are the, see how small these are? This is the entry uh, sensor. So you put, and you can do it yourself. You just stick it up there, or you can, if you want, you can put screws in, and it's very easy to install. So you don't need to get somebody coming out and traipsing around. You have total control over it. Look how small that is. So this side goes on the windowsill, this side, uh, goes on the window or on the door, and you're monitoring, but they have all kinds of monitors. They have water uh, for your you know, leaks, for your, uh, your water heater, your pipes. Here's a motion sensor. You put that in the hallway. Somebody comes down the hallway. When you're not home, you will know. Of course, you've got an emergency keypad, all the things you would want. Yard signals, window decals. I love having the big Simply Safe sign out front. You're going to want that, too. They do everything. Plus, 24-7 interactive alarm monitoring and alerts. It's, it's the best. Simply Safe. Check it out. SimplySafe.com slash twit. Protect your home and family with an A-plus home security system. A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. A-plus with me, too. And I trust it so much. I've, I've set up family members, friends, <laughs> strangers. SimplySafe.com slash twit. Quit. All right, now I have to put this all back because I, <laughs> I got to pack it all up. This one I'm keeping. Keep on trucking. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number. John in Atlanta. Hey, John. John, are you there? I pressed the button. Uh, maybe, maybe, we, may, uh, maybe, we've, uh, maybe we've lost John. I'll tell you what. I'll, let me put John on hold. Casey's... Uh, in case he just fell asleep. We've actually had that happen. And say hi to Caesar in Chula Vista. Caesar, are you there? Yes, sir. Hey, welcome. Hello. How are you doing, Leo? I Thank am you great. My call. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Uh, I called uh, regarding. Um, I have a my I have a daughter, eleven years old. She uh, she you know everything that she does now from school. Everything they they give you a website. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's incredible. No more books. I mean, yeah, I know. On email, everything, go to this website, do your homework here. Anyway. That's all well and good if you've got internet and a computer at home. I worry about kids who don't. Oh, yes, definitely. And um, I, she has an old, uh, I, you know, she has an old e-machine, you know, desktop. But, you know, it's service purpose. So I'm trying to see what you can recommend. 
for uh, she's only in fifth grade. She just finished fifth grade. So you know, for, to get, so the school uh, doesn't have a, a, a recommendation. Do they? They don't have. Do they have computers in the classroom? No, they. Uh, That's interesting. So they really. They use. Uh, uh, you know what they used? Uh, I went to the, uh, the class a couple times, and they have iPads and Chromebooks. Well, so that's what I would recommend for your daughter is a Chromebook. A Chromebook, any particular one you think? Yeah, I, yeah. There, uh, there's a lot of good ones out there right now, but I'm a big fan of the Acer uh, Chromebooks. They make some really high quality stuff, and you have a nice I'm, price range. That's the good thing about I'm a Chromebook. Familiar. Yeah, I'm I'm familiar with Acer. They they do make Really, really good product. Yeah, uh, in my experience. Yeah. Any any particular model you recommend? Well, I would, if you can, go down to a Best Buy and take a look. Part of it is a uh, size. So they have an 11 inch Chromebook and they have a 15 inch screen Chromebook. And I think if if, if you can go with the 15 inch, that's that's a nice choice because you get a little more uh, screen. But it, it, actually, I'm seeing it for 200 bucks, so that's not that's not too bad. They have the Spin oh, is their high-end uh, Chromebook now, and uh, that's a little more expensive. And that's one that can convert into, you know, you can tent it, you can flip it over, convert it to a tablet. Those are really nice. I'm, I'm also now seeing Chromebook tablets. And I, I'm not sure I would recommend that yet because these are very uh, new. Acer has the Chromebook Tab 10. It's getting very good reviews, but uh, and maybe you know because your daughter is used to tablets like the iPad, she would like it. It comes with a pencil, you know, so she can draw on it. Uh, it's a little expensive, but I'm seeing people who, who really like it quite a bit. It's lightweight. It's pretty durable. Has a stylus, so I think sometimes for a fifth and sixth grader, the ability to draw stuff is a real desirable point. All these Chromebooks now support the Android store, which means you're getting more uh, apps. You're getting millions of apps to choose from, including a lot of great classroom stuff. If more, most more of the, yeah, if most of the stuff that the classroom, the school is giving her is web-based, Chromebook will be fine because it's, of course, got a great browser. It's got a Chrome browser in it. So you might you might look at, it's a little more expensive, the Chrome, I would say if you can go to a Best Buy and, and look at them and get her opinion on them. The Chromebook Tab 10. Yeah, Chromebook Tab 10 is about $329 list. Uh, but it's I, I will. it's got more RAM. It's a 4 gig RAM. It's a little smaller. It's 9.7, which she might like because it's more portable. It's only a pound, a little more than a pound. Um, I think this would be also a very good choice. I, I'm actually tempted myself. I'm a big fan of the Chromebooks. And I think for school, there's nothing better because it's safe, right, secure. She's going to be less tempted to, to play games on it. Uh, or to you know to get sucked into you know, of course you can still watch yeah. YouTube and, and all of that. But uh, I think this is a really nice. It's got a USB C charging port, but you can also connect it to displays and data, which is, they have which a, is nice. They have camera, do they? Do they have? They camera? sure do. And I think the camera. Um, yeah, you want the camera because yeah, it's got a, both yeah, a front because, camera and a rear camera. Great. Yeah, my 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 sons. That's why I. Uh, she has uh, older brothers, and uh, they Skype, and they're in the military, so that's how they, they, they talk to her. Perfect that's for why. that. Perfect for that. Great. And uh, and you can get Skype in the Android store. And I also think people, uh, kids that age, often want to make videos. And so having a rear camera that's fairly good, it's only 5 megapixels, good enough, though, for 1080p video, that's nice. She can, she can uh, I, I notice great. kids doing that all the time with their iPads. I think that's a great additional feature. Great! Oh, thank you so much. And I have, and then the other one was my, uh, um, my, uh, my personal. Uh, I have a personal laptop. It's. I mean, I had it for for a while. It's it, it, it serves its purpose, but I want to upgrade. I it's. Uh, I have an old uh, Windows Seven uh, uh, Asus K fifty two. Very nice, Which also. Way? Yeah. I, I actually upgraded it uh, to a solid state uh, well, a, couple, you know, a couple of years ago and worked great. I'm looking into something to upgrade. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I know what's you mentioned your, the what, XPS. What's your price range? You know, I, I don't have one. If I have to spend a thousand bucks, I'll be, you know, twelve hundred, thirteen. I don't know. I'm a whatever, big uh, fan. In fact, I'm using it right now of the Lenovo ThinkPads. If you want something that's going to last a long time, they are really robust. Not the cheaper Lenovo's, but the ThinkPad line. This is the old IBM line that Lenovo bought some years ago. And they just continue to be really great keyboards, great trackpads. 
Uh, I think these are my favorite Windows 10 machines. I, I, did, uh, I still like the Dell XPS line. It's a little pricey. The advantage the XPS well, has is there's very, is almost bezel-less on the screen. So this, you get more screen size in a smaller footprint. What uh, size do they come, that thing pack? Any size you want. They even have 17 inches. <laughs> still I mean, yeah, I, was, I was a big fan of... Uh, I, 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 I always liked the bigger screen, but lately, for some reason, I like the... It seems a 13 inches uh, nice they have, to carry they around have, with you. They have, and... they have 13s. They have, I think they're 14s, but the same. I like the Perfect. T series. Um, that's a little less expensive. Those are the business versions of the ThinkPads. If you want to get the sexy version, it's more expensive. But uh, then look at the X series. The the Carbon X is beautiful. But I personally like all. I want all the connectors. I want the USB ports. I want the HDMI. I want the Ethernet ports. The T series is really good. I think the 580 just came out. I have a 480 right here that I'm using. I just love it. So And I can put a, and, and you can actually plug a, a DVD on a, on a Absolutely. A, on a USB DVD drive so you don't lose that capability. I wouldn't build one in cuz you're not going to use it that often, but it's nice to have one on USB. Uh, this also uh, the this T series you can put a second battery in and get all day battery life. I, I think these are more like tanks. They're not sexy as much as as very utilitarian. So lately, I've been just a big fan of the Lenovo uh, ThinkPad series, particularly the, C, the T series. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this. He's been everywhere, man. I ain't talking about Johnny Cash. I'm talking about Johnny Jet. He is our travel guru at johnnyjet.com. Joins us every week to help us travel better with technology. Today, he joins us from Delray Beach, Florida, where it's, what, 100 degrees in the shade. No, it's not that warm. It's I think it was 87 degrees. It's oh, hot and humid. Bad. It's hotter here. Um, it's like 100 degrees in Petaluma. But well, it's a dry yeah. heat. Well, here is a wet heat, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's it, but it's beautiful, and the the ocean is warm. I'm at the Delray Beach Marriott, and nice. um, in all of Florida, including this place, you can get some really good summer rates. I just checked, 150 dollars a night here. But if you want a, a cheap place to go in the summer, come down to Florida. Because it's too hot. Especially. Nobody wants to be in Florida in this in the in the summertime. Well, everyone would rather be up in New England, where it, you know yeah. the weather's great because yeah. most of the people are snowbirds. So. Right. So the rates are cheap, and um, you don't you know you don't have to fight for a pool chair. Although today it seemed pretty busy down by the pool, but uh, <laughs> normally you don't have to. Nice. Sounds like you're having yeah. fun. You're visiting. I know you're visiting your dad who lives down there. Yeah, I was yeah. visiting with my dad. How's he doing? He's doing pretty play. well. He, you know, two weeks ago he was in the hospital. Today we just played golf. Nice. And I just posted a little video of him on my Facebook, I, so he's doing great. I saw him driving the golf cart. I thought that was cute. Yeah, that was the first time he's driven in like ten years, and nice. you know, he just—he was like a kid. He had a smile on his face, Aww. like you know, I did when I was sixteen years old driving for the first time. Yep. Um, you know, by yeah. the time your your dad's age, people might not be driving anything at all. Yeah. You know, you might just be riding around in a self-driving vehicle. You know, things are changing. Actually, this week I was in Washington, D.C. for a couple nights. Um, I went down with Hilton Hotels, and they were showing me about all their new innovations. And we went to their innovation gallery, and their CEO talked to us. But they have some really cool things that they're testing out. One is a, called a Beam Smart Entertainment. Have you seen this one? Uh, I have. I own one, I think. Oh, you do? Yeah. So they're talking about maybe even taking TVs out of their hotel rooms. I mean, it's a big maybe. But they're like, you know what? There, there might not be TVs in the future. They might just be people just give people the beam, and then they'd watch it on what their computer on the wall. They'd oh, just, on the wall. just project it. Beam. Yeah, yeah. And, Interesting. And they, I mean, they had all kinds of things. They had this thing called Nightingale Sound Sleeper. They had a new Calm Deep Sleep sleeper, it's supposed to really help you sleep a lot better or, or deeper. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a competitive market, isn't it? Nowadays, you got to be. I, I saw the hotels. In uh, uh, I, I, a number of hotel chains uh, are going to start putting in. There's a special new Amazon Echo for hospitality. Yeah. I, I, that was my next thing. Tell me exactly. about that. I think that was well, really interesting. Yeah, and actually, when I just walked into this hotel, I'm friends with the concierge. She's like, you know, make sure you let these people know that Echoes cannot 
replace the concierge because you know if there's an emergency no, but like you, you can just say I would like to order ham and eggs sent to room my exactly. room and that's, that's good enough yeah for sure you're not going to say so, I want tickets to cats no but for these for these Amazon echoes so they're going to say you know open and close the blinds yeah. what's the temperature yeah. set a set a wake up call you know have some music or whatever it is bring have them have the housekeeping bring more towels up here um, so that's a beautiful thing, I think. I can't and, wait. Uh, and it resets when you check out. So, yep. uh, and the hotel doesn't get any information about you. I think this is a people really... are worried about the information. They're worried about how yeah. much they're going to be listening to you, spy. Oh, you. I don't worry about that. They're not. They're not calling home unless you say the uh, the trigger word. Right. But you got people Amazon. forget you got a phone in your pocket with a microphone, camera, GPS. <laughs> I mean, yes. you got it in your pocket. They don't that need to turn true. on the echo. They can follow you everywhere. If they want to listen, and, and some of them do, actually, some of the airlines, I think, I think someone was telling me one of the airlines they want you to, um, you know, give, you know, give access to wherever you're going, so they know if you're flying the competitors and how many times oh, you're in man. airports and not flying their yeah. airlines. So yeah. then they know to send you. Your phone is absolutely deal. a spy device. If you enable location tracking in your United Airlines app, who knows what they're gonna? That means they can track you all the time, not just when you're on United. Right. Yeah. But one of the hotel, actually, well, Hilton's smart because they partnered with Amazon. And now what they're doing is they're setting up the Amazon lockers in some of their hotels. So you can deliver food within two hours or have, if, if you forget your microphone or your mouse, I can whatever order, you need. I can order Gino's North Pizza from Chicago delivered to the locker. <laughs> I well, don't know. <laughs> when, when, no, but when I travel, you know, I usually don't use hotel room service because it's expensive. The food's not that good, and it's not really local. Yeah. Instead, I go on Postmates or Uber Eats or whatever and have it delivered, and you get something local, and it's usually oh, better and a lot cheaper. Oh, that's interesting. So oh, that's this what is, I do. When I, oh, I don't see, we're learning. Postmates or Uber. You have to find the one that's available in that in that neck of the woods, but. Yeah. yeah, and down here it's called Delivery Dudes. I used that two weeks ago when I was <laughs> delivery here. Delivery Dudes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, they it's only the Delivery $5 dude, man. Extra. I'm here. I brought your pizza. So give us a – every week Johnny joins us with a uh, a site and an app. What do you got for us this week? All right. So actually here's one. Delivery Dudes. Pet Airways. What are you talking about? So this actually this, – these guys used to be in business between 2009 and 2011. Unfortunately, they went – went under, but they're trying to come back and they're actually having some kind of fundraiser right Is now. Is it a plane but just for your pet? Exactly. It's a small plane, but they don't allow humans except the pilots, obviously, and the person who takes care of the pets. I don't want but to be the want, flight attendant on that flight. <laughs> but they, you know, you know, supposedly they flew 10,000 animals. They call them passengers. Passengers. Petairways.com. But they're yes. not back yet. They're trying to get back. Not back yet. So I'm just mentioning them because to keep an eye out on them. Hopefully they'll get their funding. But and some people can actually um, contribute now and and get some shares of it. But um, you know, there's a lot of pet fanatics out there and pet lovers. And I'm a pet lover, although I travel well, too much. We don't and, have. Pets. And it would may be nice, even as a not. I have pets. I'm not taking my cats anywhere. <laughs> but uh, it would be nice not to have to fight peacocks. Uh, in the main cabin anymore. A lot of people well, bring in their companion pets. Yeah, uh, well, they're cracking down on those, the, yeah. pe the peacocks. And United, yeah. actually, Delta this week just banned um, pit bulls. So well, there's, no more you pit know what? Pit bulls are sweet dogs. They get a bad rap because people train them to be killers. But they're I'm sweet the dogs. They're nice dogs. They they can be. Yes, they can be. But you know, so but you can't bring your peacock or your pet snake anymore on these airlines. But yeah, right on. <laughs> That's in the cabin, but you know some of the bigger animals that you do not want to put in the cargo hold, especially in the summertime or oh, freezing no, cold. Oh no, that's terrible! Yeah, uh, this is a great alternative. So you know, keep your Airways. eye out. PetAirways. PetAirways.com. Yes. Nice. And then I got an app if we have time. Yeah. Uh, it's called Rescuer. R E S C U E R. It's only for uh, Android right now. They said they're working on the iOS. But speaking about your phone spying on you just a few minutes ago, how it has access to everything, if you say – you can set it up to say a keyword, a key phrase across the room, and it will silently send out pictures and, and audio oh, wow. and a GPS. It's, so to let people know, you know, 911 or whoever you're calling, um, you could also – use your volume buttons and do a certain way. I think it's up and down, up, and then it will automatically do the same thing, set out 
all your coordinates, or you nice. can have um, you give access to your friends or loved ones a passcode, and they can tell you where exactly you are. I like it. I like it. Rescuer for uh, Android. It's free. And uh, unfortunately, it says it's incompatible with all my devices. So I, I have a few that Android phones, but <laughs> maybe that's because I'm not logged in. Maybe, uh, maybe that, maybe that. But check it okay. out. A lot of good reviews. They say it's a woman's safety app, but it could be for men too. And anybody who wants to stay safe. I like that. Sure. Rescuer app. And Johnny Jet, well, you have a great time in Delray Beach. Thank you. I'm only here for a few more hours. Oh, all right. And then. I'm, I'm off again. I'm out of the plane in a few hours. And we'll find out where he goes. But you can find out if you follow him on uh, Twitter, Johnny Jet, on Instagram, Johnny Jet, or go to his website, johnnyjet.com. Thank you, Johnny. Thank Safe you. travels, Thank as you. always. Thank you. Thank you. One T, by the way. I'm not related to Joan. Only one. <laughs> no relation <laughs> to Joan. He used to be Johnny Jet Ski, if that That's tells right. you anything. But I'm not Polish, so I dropped the ski. <laughs> Thanks, John. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Back to the phones right after this. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. That Thanks, sounded I, I, great. I, I, I oh, think good. we fixed the problem, yeah. All right. Well, thank you for sending me this. Yeah, good. I'm glad you and, got it. Uh, Did we send it to Toronto? Where did we send it? No, you sent it to here, to Florida. To Florida. Yeah, it's hard for yeah. us to send overseas. So. Good. Well, not really overseas, Toronto, but it is over a lake. <laughs> <laughs> Internationally. You're right. It isn't overseas, is it? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 88, 88 Ask Leo. Uh, now let's try John in Atlanta, see if he's awake. Hi, John. Hey. Leo, hey. Can you hear me now? I hear you now. Welcome. Well, I tell you, I, I, I guess I've been spoiled calling into your show because I'm usually first. Oh, <laughs> you didn't make it this time, but you got in. I did not. That's all that matters. So, Thanks for hanging on. Well, somehow, my, somehow my phone went on mute, but that's okay. Oh, yeah, I, that's, that happens. I, uh, anyway, uh, anyway, I was following up with you a couple months ago. I told you I'd purchased the Owl Cam based yeah. on your strong recommendation. It's a, it's a dashboard a cam that shoots forward and backwards and has some nice features. It's always connected. It's got LTE built in. Uh, I've been using it uh, uh, since we talked about it. Tell me what you think. I'm I'm really liking it. I I don't have any incidents to report. Thank goodness. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I have mixed feelings about that because neither do I, and I keep waiting for something to happen so I can send a clip back. I know. <laughs> and I almost invited something one day because I was going down this familiar road that had two lanes, and I knew the right lane was going to end, and there's signs that say it's going to end. And so this car pulled up to me when there was only going to be a few feet left before the lane ended, and I thought I'm going to see what they do. I kept my eye there, and I, you know, and uh, sure enough, they just decided to come right into my lane where I had to slam on my brakes. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I didn't hit them, but I thought, boy, this would have been a great capture for the. Uh, you have to. Now, I guess they have yeah. impact sensing so that if you do get in an accident, they will immediately send pictures back to the server. Uh, so that if something bad happens, you don't have to make a note of it. But you, but you also have the capability of recording clips by just saying, okay, presto, and it will start yeah, you know, I, send a clip back. I actually played with the editing software. I'm not sure if you're liking their editing software, but, you know, where you can do a five-minute clip or ten minutes. So I, when I got home, I, you know, I, I, I downloaded that, you know, video and played around with the editing piece and, you know, got that, that, that part where I almost, I almost wrecked just to show people – you know what I can record on that owl. Cam. Yeah, it's so it has built in. Uh, so it, it sends clips back to this owl server, but it also has a built-in memory, and uh, you right. can record up to the capacity of the memory, and then it'll record over on top of it. And it saves it if anything interesting has happened. I'm just looking, scrubbing through it, and nothing at all interesting has happened to my camera uh, since I got out of the car. But that's nice that you have it, right? Yeah, and I don't know if you're noticing when they make the software changes how some of the messages are starting to change. I have noticed uh, that, and they do that. That's the other reason, and I always recommend this if you get a, a, an Internet-connected device. You want something, because it's on the Internet, it's at risk, you want something that's automatically going to update itself. And the OWL definitely is doing it. It's a brand-new device, so uh, you know it makes sense that it's going to well, uh, have lots of updates. Yeah. Yeah, you know, when it, it used to sense you, even if you had your key in your phone, 
assist you and just start to send out the alert, you know, possible intruder or something. I know. Now that method has changed to possible impact detected. Yeah, but and no, that's that changed effort. again. you got to get the new firm where it says driver detected. No, I got that too, Leo. I noticed that when I got in the car last night that it did say driver detected. Driver detected. Thought, well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, so I yeah. like that because now it's not shining those white lights on me. Those white lights, when they come on, you, you have to admit, are pretty bright. I, I agree. Then that's for that's for if somebody breaks into your car, the lights come on and record the break-in. And even if they steal the camera, it will upload the video to the OWL servers. So you'll get nice video of somebody stealing your camera. They say they'll replace your camera if it gets stolen. Uh, I think this yeah. is I think this is kind of a you know there's a lot of dashboard cams this one's pricier than most because it includes the LTE coverage for a year or something like that but I think that there's uh, you know I I like having a camera just in case just in case yeah, now I what, one thing I've noticed with the guests that ride in my car there's a couple of people uh when they ride they don't like being recorded uh they kind of one of those they say oh uh, yeah press. we're just going to all have to get like used that. to that aren't we well, the nice thing is, too, is that if you just touch the bottom of the screen, you can easily turn off the inside camera, which I like that feature. Right. So it's only recording on the outside. Right. So anybody that's a little uncomfortable in my car, of course, they could drive or... But that's <laughs> interesting. That so you've off. had people get in the car and say, what is that? Is that a camera? Turn that off. Exactly. Wow. I've had a couple of paranoid neighbors uh, wow. going to dinner that said, ah, I don't like that, and really got upset. And so I just, you know, turned off the bottom camera. Just How interesting! Them. Yeah, I haven't I haven't uh, encountered anybody like that, but I don't take people in my car much. So <laughs> and, uh, we're in the dog days. You know, we're here in Atlanta. We're in the dog days of summer, so I'm liking the fact that it turns itself automatically when it feels like the car is too hot. Yep. So yep. that's it happening. Protect, it protects now. itself. Yeah. Yep. I noticed that if you park in the sun or whatever, it'll it'll turn itself off to protect itself. Yeah. And here here in Georgia, come July 1st, uh, a new law takes effect where we're not allowed to hold phones while we're driving which right. i'm tickled i don't know if california is doing oh, that. oh we've had that for a couple of years doesn't stop people oh. but if they get caught there's a big fine yeah so hopefully you know if you're if you're in an accident or something with somebody the camera's also going to kind of pick up you know based on i guess where the impact is that somebody had a phone well that's what one of the things I, it, it's a mixed bag but it is recording outside and it's recording you so right. uh, if you were inattentive, uh, the insurance company would have record of that. On the other hand, you know, I've had a case where uh, I ran into something that was on the highway. I would love to have, because they said, well, you must have been paying attention. I would love to have the video to say, well, look, I'm watching. Watch that thing fall off the truck. Watch me hit it, even though I tried to avoid it. They'd have the complete record. So I guess it could cut both ways, depending on how how good a driver you are you know the, remember the uber uh, terrible uber story of, of the uh, uber self-driving vehicle that that killed a pedestrian a few months ago they now know uh, because everything's recorded that the driver the safety driver we knew she was inattentive because we saw a video of her looking down a lot she was watching the voice on her phone right. while she was driving so a, a camera in the car can catch bad behavior as well as good behavior <laughs> but on the other hand it makes I'm, i find a teenager man i would put this thing in the car for sure yeah I, i'm very pleased with it so far good. i mean for you know what it is uh and i and, and and on that on that note i'd like to if you wouldn't mind do a shout out to a lot of the other products that i've purchased based on your inspiration or plug, thank you uh and uh you know to, to alert your advertisers that, hey that this is a really great place to advertise it yes for some it is. Uh, but good... anyway i uh <laughs> So I'm going to see if I can top some of your other callers because I've heard them go through some lists. But anyway, I personally have purchased LastPass, based Thank on your you. recommendation. A Pass, sponsor. PassMail. Yes. PassMail. They don't, they're not and a sponsor, but I do recommend them. I know. I know you recommend them. And so and I, I've been very pleased with them. Um, Synology NAS, I have. I'm, I'm, I also have not a sponsor. sponsor. we got to get these guys to buy some ads. <laughs> Well, that's, well, unfortunately, we still listen to you. The Dash keyboard. Uh, upper, I don't know if they're a sponsor. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, you know, this is the thing. I used to listen to radio. and In fact, yeah. every once in a while, somebody would call and say, can I mention a name? And you'd, you'd hear this on radio. Well, I don't mention any brand names. I want to talk about specific brands because we need to help people choose good stuff. And, and when stuff's bad, tell them it's bad. Right. And I don't any of these products I'm mentioning, I've been very pleased with. I've ordered from Fracture. Fracture Me. They are a sponsor. Very pleased with them. Very pleased with them. Uh, I, I've got six Scotty vests, by the way. 
<laughs> because I just they, they used to be a sponsor, not a sponsor anymore. Right, uh, and I don't. I saw you on a show one time, not this show, but another show. I was watching, and you had a Duluth Trading Leather travel bag. I love my Duluth stuff. I love and it. So I bought one too. <laughs> I wear their underwear. I wear their pants. I wear uh, that bag is a great bag. Yeah, unfortunately, they're not an advertiser either. In fact, it sounds like mostly I'm selling you stuff that I don't get any money for. But that's okay. I know. I don't, so that's I'm okay. I don't. I don't want to be a shill all the time. Hey, I got to take a break for a sponsor, but. <laughs> I thank you for the call. And I will mention that the Owl Cam, which is not a sponsor either, is $349. That's expensive, but they they you know, they have a money back 30-day guarantee. And it's owlcam.com. If you're looking at a dashboard cam, it's more expensive than some of the others, but has more features than some of the others. And I, I think I'm I kept it. I bought it and I like it. Hey, thanks for the call. It's great to talk to you, John. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's take a break. Come back with more calls right after this. Our show today, let's talk about wine. <laughs> I'd rather, from let's talk about wine. And this is not wine made in China, but it is wine made all over the world. I'm a member of Wink, and I love Wink. It's the best way to discover new wines you will love. When you go to trywink, T-R-Y-W-I-N-C, dot com slash tech guy, you can take their taste test, their palate profile quiz. It'll ask you simple things like, how do you like your coffee? Or do you not like coffee at all? Do you like blueberries? Do you like peppers? Do you like mushrooms? Different taste profiles to give you some recommendations. And then they'll send you wines curated to your taste. You get to pick how many red, how many white. I'm all red myself. But I tell you what, there's, they have a summer water rosé right now that I would love a nice chilled bottle of that right now. That is awesome. You actually should include that in your box. It's not a, It's not just a wine club. It's a wine company. They work directly with top winemakers and growers from around the world. They make all their own wine. Let's see. I got a Wink box today. The nice thing about this is instead of getting the same wine all the time, you can try different wines, find wines you like. We, uh, we're, we And because you get four bottles a month... Uh, and, of course, you could take a month off anytime you want. It's nice. You've got a couple of dinners, maybe a, a bottle to put away for the future in your, in your wine cellar, maybe a bottle to uh, share with friends. It's always nice to have some delicious wine. Let's see what we have here. Forma de Vida. This is uh, bottled by Wink. All of it is uh, made by Wink, but it's a Tempranillo from Lodi. Oh, that's nice. I love Tempranillo. Here's a white Sauvignon Blanc from Santa Barbara County. They're, they're from all over the world. The best winemakers. Oh, here's an Italian. Frappato. I love the labels, too. They get great local artists making these beautiful labels. And you'll be proud to bring it as a friend, as a gift to a friend. Cape Route. A Chenin Blanc from South Africa. So look at that. W-I-N-C. Trywink.com. No membership fees, skip any month, cancel any time. Shipping is covered, and if you don't like a bottle, no problem. They'll send you another bottle. No questions asked. You don't have to return the old bottle. I love Wink. Great way to relax in the summertime with that summer water rosé, to celebrate with friends, to enjoy a fine meal. Sit back and relax and enjoy your Wink. Why settle for the same bottle of wine you always get? Discover great wine today. Go to trywink.com slash Tech Guy for $20 off your first shipment. T R Y W I N C dot com slash Tech Guy. This is all we get now. And I I'm so happy with the wink. Loving the wink. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the Tech Guy. Time to talk about computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, privacy, security, all that stuff. Everything to do with a, anything with a chip in it. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. If you hear us talking about something, a product or a site or a solution to a problem, you can always find out more at the website because we write it all down. James DeRuvo writes it all down for later consumption. That way you don't have to write it down while you're driving around town or whatever you're doing today. The website is techguylabs.com, and you can go there and add your thoughts. So if you disagree or I get something wrong or you've got additional information, that's a good place to do it, techguylabs.com. It's much more effective than just shouting at the radio. Never found that useful. I can't hear you. Rich on the line from 
It must be very hot today, Tucson, Arizona. Hi, Rich. Hey, Leo. How's it going? It's going great. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. You're right. It is pretty darn hot out here in the desert Woo. southwest. Woo! Summertime. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, once June hits, it's pretty much all over for four months. Uh, first, I got to say thank you. You saved me so much money. Oh, gosh. How? The last time I talked to you was like six months or a year ago, and I was having trouble with my TV set. Um, the sound was going out. It was like slowly fading out. Ooh. And you said, well, if you've got a, an optical audio in on the TV, but for a TV of that age, you probably don't. But I went ahead and I looked, and I did. And so ah, I just bought a sound bar, and nice. I was able to, in, instead of having to replace the whole TV, I just plugged the sound bar in, and it was, it's been great ever since. Wonderful. I'm so glad so that worked. I know that you like to spend people's money, but thank you for saving me a lot of money. <laughs> well, we spent a little bit to save a lot, so that was worth it. Good. <laughs> it yeah, was. It good. was. I'm glad to know so that my worked. Current situ- yeah, yeah. My, my current situation is that um, I'm an audiobook narrator, and I just finished building a, uh, a vocal booth that is a lot smaller than where I used to record. So I used to have my, um, my laptop outside my recording space, and I had an HDMI cable and a wireless keyboard and trackpad in the, in the space. But now, since the booth is so small, I can't really use this for a desk. And so what I want to do is I want to have my monitor in here, but I want to have my laptop outside on a desk in the room, and I want to have another monitor on the desk, and I want the, the displays to be exactly the same. So I started looking up HDMI splitters, and I found that there's a whole ton of them out there that you can buy. But what I couldn't find was whether or not what I want to do is actually going to be doable on my 2012 MacBook Air, which is old and creaky. And I want to make sure that running two different monitors that are simply displaying the laptop screen in two different places is not going to cause some kind of problem with the laptop. Yeah, so um, you have you want to have two monitors. You don't you don't. It wouldn't be okay just to have the air display outside and the monitor inside this booth. Um, with my aging eyes, I would really rather have a big a monitor. big monitor on both. Yeah, because I know for yeah. sure you could do that. Just have an external monitor in the booth. Um, the <laughs> splitters. Yeah, it should work. I mean, it's a sometimes it can degrade the signal a little bit, but a splitter doesn't require anything of the MacBook Air. It's doing it all. That's the difference between having two monitors that are mirrored and one external monitor that is split. Uh, they are mirrored, but they're split. So, yeah, I think mm -hmm. you shouldn't have any. If you can get an external monitor run off that Air, and I'm pretty sure you can, it's got a mini display it, port, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it does, and so that's yeah. what I'm using is I'm using a mini display port to HDMI yeah. um, adapter. Yeah. And so I was just going to use uh, that same adapter going into a splitter and then have the splitter, the powered splitter, go to two separate monitors. Yeah, the key is one powered. and one outside. You said the right word. Yeah. Powered is important because you really can't just split the signal. You need to kind of amplify it a little bit. So, yeah, I, I think that's like. a great solution, uh, and they're not expensive. So I'm seeing one on Amazon for 15 bucks. so... That's, that's what I saw was anywhere from 15 to 50, depending on what you're looking for. And I don't need four ports. I just need two. I just wanted to make sure that, because I, I didn't find any reference to this, I just wanted to make sure that yeah. it's not going to make the MacBook Air drive. It any doesn't harder. do anything more to the Air. The Air doesn't know from one monitor. It thinks it's just on okay. one monitor. So, yeah, that'd, right. be, well, that'd be fine. Yeah, that's actually a good idea. What's the resolution on that external monitor? Because I love MacBook Airs, but they're so low resolution on their internal screen. I just can't bear so, it. Fortunately, that hasn't really been a big problem for me because I use a fairly fairly big screen just so yeah. that I can see things better. Yeah. So what I'm using on my, on my Dell monitor inside the booth right now is um, 1,600 by 900. Yeah, that's, that's about, I think, what the... I think it's 1280 by 900, but that's, you know, that's not super high res, but if it's okay for you, that's fine. What yeah. I might recommend, <laughs> basically, you've got a teleprompter is what you're doing, right? Do you need keyboard mm -hmm. access or is, would it be enough just to have a, a knob in the booth? Because there are companies that make USB knobs the, like no, the Griffin really, PowerMate. Yeah, I really need the keyboard. Okay. Okay. I need it in both places, and so I'm using a Logitech uh, wireless or a, wire, a Logitech, uh, yeah, Logitech wireless, and then a, a Bluetooth trackpad. Perfect. Now I've got to yeah, ask you about the audiobooks. Who do you do? Who do you read audiobooks for? 
Um, a, a few different places. I've done quite a few on ACX. I'm sure you're familiar with ACX. Yeah. And um, I've done a lot for Pitchstone Publishing. And nice. I just went to APAC, the Audio Publishers Association Conference in New York a few weeks ago. And there are several people I'm going to be contacting uh, at, having been there and met, met a lot of people. And I also do a podcast on audiobook production, ah, which nice. has introduced me to a whole bunch of people. So, um, so it, yeah, it's, it's great. I know you listen to audiobooks and love them. Uh, I am a huge audiobook fan. You've got a beautiful voice. ACX yeah, is cool they, because you choose the book you want to narrate. So, uh, you yeah, know. Yeah, and, and there are options. Right. Uh, and I think that'd be a lot of fun. Although my experience is it's not the beautiful voice. It's the acting ability, oddly enough, because there are uh, there are audiobook readers who don't have particularly great voices, but because they can bring a book to life. Uh, Absolutely. I'm thinking of Roy Dotrice, who does the, the Game of Thrones books. He uh, mm -hmm. his voice is a little weird and gravelly, but man, does he bring those books to life? Yeah, it, it is all about the acting. It yeah. is, isn't it? It's, it's funny because there are a lot of people who come... I know that you have a radio background. There are a lot of people who come from radio. And and a lot of times they have to kind of unlearn what they've learned right. to actually do the voice acting part. Yes. Because um, it's a very, very different medium. It is indeed. And uh, it's not about yeah. announcing. It's about acting. Are yeah. you an actor yeah, by, uh, by training? So not when I was younger. I got into acting uh, on stage about 20 years ago, and then I just kind of took off from there. Nice. And uh, I've been doing doing audiobooks for about four years now. I did some uh, pro bono audiobook work about 10 years ago. Great way to get for, started. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it really is. It's, I've done a couple uh, of them for friends, and I did one for a short one for Audible. And I have huge respect for anybody who can do it it's because it's it's actually... It sounds like, oh, you just read a book. How hard could that be? It's hard. <laughs> it's really yeah, hard. Take, What's the name of your uh, podcast? Uh, I want to listen to it. Sure, yeah. It's called The Audiobook Speakeasy. And uh, it's all about just sitting down for, uh, for an hour with somebody in the audiobook business and having a drink and talking about their role in the audiobook production process. So I talk to narrators and narration coaches and engineers um, I haven't yet, but I'm going to very soon have like a power listener on who listens to like an audiobook a day. I mean, she is constantly listening <laughs> wow. to audiobooks. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that yeah, fast. <laughs> I'm not that fast. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I will, uh, I will, uh, li I listen to the Audiobook Speakeasy podcast. Looks really great. Rich, it's nice. Yeah, it's no, nice it's, to talk to you and good, good luck. I look forward to hearing something of uh, yours on Audible. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Check me out, and uh, there's, there's. I'm sure that there are some in there. I know you like science stuff. I got some science stuff nice. in there. I've got uh, uh, some various different fiction things, uh, and the podcast is just a lot of fun. So I bet it is. somebody who sounds interesting and and uh, have a drink and join us. I appreciate it. I will. And thank you so much for your call. I appreciate it, Rich. Yeah, I love audiobooks. It's really for me. It's uh, it's brought reading back into my life because it's you know I, I bet you i mean you may know what i'm talking about when you get in bed you got a book and you get about a halfway through the page and <laughs> half a page a day it's just not gonna work no you can't keep track of it so uh the nice thing about audiobooks is i can listen uh, while i'm in the car and uh, you know doing housework and stuff like that i i'm a big fan and that's one of the reasons i love podcasts and radio let's not forget right leo laporte the tech guy 8888 ask leo more calls coming up right after this. Winter is coming. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I wish. <laughs> 88, 80, 88 ask Leo. Uh, first uh, tech guy of the summer. Hope you're enjoying it. Go to line four now. Jim in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Hello, Jim. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing okay. You know, listening to your show got me sidetracked because I only read audio books because I'm legally blind. And when you started talking about Jon Snow, I keep, I've been waiting for the next book to come out. Um, of Game of Thrones, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've read all the books, but there's another one to come for like two years now. Oh, more than that, and I have a feeling it's going to be more years than that. Because like George R.R. R. Martin, who wrote the Game of Thrones series, and has written five of them so far, I yeah. think he's kind of lost his way. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I think fame and fortune and the TV show have just distracted him. We need to, We need to lock him into a tower. 
<laughs> sit him down and say, finish it. Yeah. Finish I kept it. telling my friends, I can't believe that Jon Snow is dead. I just can't believe it. He's going to have to come back some way. So, anyway. and then You're the obviously a is, little behind, but we, I'm not going to. He just got married. Isn't that sweet? He just got married uh, in Scotland to the woman in the TV show. Who plays? Uh, I think Egret is her name. She's the barbarian who shot him with an arrow, and uh, and uh, now they're married. So they're gonna. That's a. So you mean that, in real life they got married? They got married in real life, and it's cute. Uh -huh. No, this has nothing uh -huh. to do with the book. This is in real. The uh -huh. actors. Okay. The actors got married. Yeah. 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 Anyway, yeah. that's what we were talking about. I don't know what happens in the books. In fact, I think the TV show is now departed pretty much a hundred percent from the books. Yeah, I I never have watched the TV show. No, but, if you uh, heard the books, you're really getting, I think, a better experience, in my opinion. Oh uh, yeah, they're, it's much better. I love yeah, it. Yeah, really um, beautifully read. Here in your previous callers, who does read books, I've read over uh, about eleven to twelve hundred books already. Wow. When I say read, I listen to them, and uh, that's in the last ten years. So it's a lot of books. I use the uh, I use the same uh, term, listened. And I call it reading, but a lot of people say, no, it's not reading. Yeah. yeah. But it is reading. And for you, it's yeah. the only option you have. So I yeah. think that's fantastic. I, uh, I'm a, I, well, I think audio books are great. Yeah, let me tell you what's going on with me. I, well, one thing, this is related, but I download my books from the Library of Congress. They have a site I can go to because yep. I'm legally blind. Awesome. Okay, and and I've been doing this for 15 years, no problems at all. However, on my computer, all of a sudden, um, in the last two months, I cannot download a book. So um, I get on the site, I can do the searches, I do everything like I always did, but everything is extremely slow, hmm. and uh, I, I I will not download, no matter how long I wait for the book to download. Usually it takes about two or three minutes. I'll wait 20, 30, 40 minutes, and I'll never download. This is so the National Library Service that the Library of Congress offers for Braille and uh, and talking books. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, it's great service. They have uh, quite a few books. Well, have you listened to all 1,100 books from the NLS? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's it is. really fantastic. But I've narrowed it down. Here's what happened. I had a guy that knows computer stuff locally here, and he... He voluntarily helped me. Good. We found out my computer had upgraded. I use Windows 7. It upgraded to Internet Explorer 11. And then um, 11, will, for some reason, will not let me download. So this guy took me back to Windows 8, not Windows, I'm sorry, to Internet Explorer 8, and everything works fine. It's fast. It downloads. But I go to some sites and they say you need to upgrade yeah. your browser. I don't know if he did you any favors. That is a very insecure version of Internet Explorer. Um, yeah. And you really should use uh, a more modern version. You're saying you're using Windows Seven? I'm using Windows Seven. So did you try? Oh, I guess Edge is only in ten, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, I tried, I, I, I tried Google Chrome. And you did try Chrome. I tried, yeah. I tried Firefox. Is it? Um, and here's the here's the other problem I have. Those work, but because I'm legally blind, I use a program called Zoom Text, right. and it reads and magnifies the screen for me. So Zoom Text will not work with Chrome or Firefox. <sighs> so I've called and talked to the company and all that, but I don't know what to do at this. I'm point. not sure anyway. why IE11, which is the current version of Internet Explorer and the one you should be using for security, I'm not sure why it wouldn't download books. You know, unfortunately, I can't get into NLS because uh, you know I don't qualify. Sure. Um, so I'm looking at it right now, but I don't know if I could I could see what the uh, what the issue is. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure why IE11 wouldn't be able to do it. Did your well, friend it goes try? In. Yeah, it goes in, but it won't. Let, it will, will not allow the actual download to occur. I wonder if that's a security setting. That's interesting. Can you can you uh, right click and say download as? Uh, yeah, I tried that. It, it just won't do it. It just it's like it doesn't get the command. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I know. You click and nothing happens. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. Anyway, it's driving me kind of crazy. I don't blame you. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't suppose the Library of Congress. Well, they do have a phone number. Uh, maybe. Oh, I called them. What did they say? And when I first called them, they said, "Well, we were having trouble with our site, but we uh, we just fixed it the last few days. So give it a couple more days, and it should be working." Well, that was two months ago. Hmm. <laughs> and then they were going to call me back twice, and I guess they're kind of busy. And, uh, and you know, uh, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I have a friend who's the uh, acting administrator of the U.S. Digital Service. One of the things they do is they take government websites that aren't working. They transform the VA website. I'm uh -huh. going to send a note to Matt Cutts and say, hey, can you take a look at the Library of Congress's site and help them make it work? Because it isn't working right now. It does sound like a JavaScript error. It sounds like poor site coding. And unfortunately, sometimes these sites just don't have the resources to do it right. Uh, you know, like commercial sites do. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let me, yeah. let me, let me send a note to Matt, though. I don't know if they... Uh, that's interesting. Uh, it should work for IE 11. That's the most recent version. You should never have to yeah. uh, regress to uh, earlier versions of IE 8. is very insecure. All sorts of flaws. In fact, I just saw a study that said that if you're using a modern browser, you don't have to worry about these. We used to talk about these all the time, these exploit kits. Because none of them uh, are, are vulnerable to any of the exploits available in the exploit kits. Unfortunately... IE8 is. Yeah. So you're. I tried IE11, oh, excuse me, 10, and it went back to 10 at one point. And I tried that and could not download with 10 even. Yeah, it sounds like that's a problem with the site, and it's really kind of a shame. I'm sure the Library of Congress doesn't have much budget for this kind of thing. And, yeah. Uh, they're, you know, whoever coded this uh, wasn't doing a good job. That's why the USDS is around, because a lot of government websites are terrible. I know, and they're and, not that, what is it, 503 compliant? Right, and Something they, like, and they have like to be either. ADA compliant. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, they're required to by law, but then they don't get any budget, and they don't, you know, they, uh, they contract these out uh, sometimes to independent contractors. That's what happened. This all started with the Affordable Care Act site, which, as you uh -huh. may remember, was a nightmare. They had yeah. a bunch of different contractors doing it. So a bunch of Silicon Valley uh, web design gurus got together and said, look, let's." We, they just went in as a strike force. That's how the USDS was started. Uh, the United States Digital Service was started as a kind of a strike force of smart people from Silicon Valley who took government sites and said, no, this has got to be done right, and fixed them. And yeah. so they fixed the ACA site, then they fixed the Veterans Affairs site. Maybe they need to do the LOC Library site. Congress. Yeah, I'll send a note to uh, Matt. He's the uh, acting director. Tell him to look at the page, too, the video, not the video, the, the pictures. They, there's no contrast. Even when I magnify, they can barely That's find ridiculous. the fields. Yeah, yeah. There is um, there is a, an address for the Library of Congress for the ADA. You might want to send this to them, ada at loc gov, and say, dudes, <laughs> you are not 508 compliant. <laughs> uh -huh. You need to do this. You need to yeah. fix this. Um, so it says the Library of Congress making every effort, but. If you are a person with a disability and have trouble using our website, please tell us about the problem. Email ada at loc.gov. Okay. So I would do that for sure. ADA, at, American Disability Act, I right. guess. Yeah, ada at loc.gov. Uh, loc yeah. Okay. Maybe they'll give you some, because they're legally required to do so. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, they have a, a little window of time, and I'm sure they have very little budget. And then I'll send a note to Matt. All right. I appreciate that, Leo. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hey, 1,100 books. That's impressive. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I don't watch TV, and I don't, you know. And you're so much happier, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I am happier. Right? I I love audiobooks. I listen. Radio a lot, though, too. No, radio's great. Podcasts are great. Audiobooks are great. We live, oddly enough, in a golden age of audio. Yep. Isn't that weird? Who would have thunk I, it? I have uh, an internet radio, actually two, from uh, Grace. Love those Grace radios. Yeah, I gave yeah. my mom one. And yeah. uh, I love it. That's what yeah. I listen to. Yeah. You can get thousands of stations all over the world. Yes. Yeah. Do you listen to spoken Grace. word on the Grace? Say what? Any spoken word stations? Uh, well, I listen to KFI. There you go. Every, every day. And <laughs> That's a good one. And then I listen one. to some of the local stations. <laughs> good. 
I have uh, Pandora. There's some BBC stations. There's some audiobook stations. Oh, yeah. There's some interesting stuff. Hey, I got to run. Thank you for the call, though. I appreciate it. All right. Bye. All right. Take care. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, talking a little more with our previous caller, uh, I was glad to see that the Library of Congress has a whole page devoted to accessibility, as they should. I mean, that really is part of the mission, isn't it, of the Library of Congress? Not only to gather all of the books in the world and all the information together, but also to make it accessible to people with varying abilities. And so if you go to loc.gov slash accessibility, they have lots of information there, including a mobile app, which might be the solution. <clears throat> it's called BARD, the uh, NLS Braille and Audio Reading Download book. And it's available on iOS and Android and Amazon Fire devices. So I, I didn't mention this until I looked this up, but it might be worth uh, checking out for our, uh, our previous caller. Um, the BARD mobile app. Look for it on iOS or Android. And it's, I'm sure, able to get those books. So you don't have to download them onto your computer. You can get, you can get them that way. 8888 Ask Leo. More of the Tech Guy Show. Alan in Moore Park, California. Hello, Alan. How you doing? I am well. How are you? Um, I got a problem. I got an Android 7 tablet, and I can't get the text-to-speech, uh, the, the speech-to-text app to work where you dictate your notes. Hmm. Yeah. Um, is it... Uh, okay, so uh, it's under speech, tap text-to-speech options. Um, well, that's text yeah, to speech. You want speech to text, though, don't you? You want to dictate. The thing of it is, I had the exact same device from Scamazon a month ago, <laughs> and and I sent it back because it got a bad battery, and I got this replacement. And on the first one, it worked. Hmm. So, are you dictating uh, from the keyboard? Where are you dictating? How are you getting that to start? Yeah, in theory, you're dictating from the keyboard into email yeah. or the uh, notes app, and then it it says can't access server. Try again. Oh, okay. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, the current state of the art with voice dictation is that it has to send it back. This is true of, of Siri as well as uh, Android dictation. In most cases, you have to send it back to the servers to do the processing, which will then send the text to your phone. And that actually adds a, a bit of a delay, which is annoying. And if you don't have a good internet connection, it won't work at all. And uh, for a long time with Siri, the servers, you know, the Siri has many, 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 this is the Apple solution, has many, many different servers. And half the time you'd get a server that works well, half the time you'd get a server that wasn't online or didn't work or something. And that became very frustrating. Apple's upgraded that. And I think both companies are trying to move closer to on-device dictation. But the problem is it takes a lot of storage and a lot of memory to do that. And typically, these devices don't. So it's saying it can't get online. That's why it can't complete the dictation. You have Internet access on that device, though, right? Yeah, it's a phablet. Okay, so you're able to open the browser and surf around and all that. Yeah, I got T-Mobile 4G. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder uh, what's going on there. Um, I'm afraid from a remote distance, as I am, uh, I can't tell you what's wrong. I mean, I understand that what it's saying is it can't get online. It can't get to that server. Does it do it all the time or just occasionally? All the time. All the time. It never works, and I've tried about ten different uh, speech to text programs. Well, yeah, I mean, there's one built in, which is on the keyboard. If you're using the Google keyboard, you well, no, there's nothing built in on Amazon on Android Seven. They eliminated it. You have to get a new app. You have to get an app to make it work on Android Seven. Oh, the Google Voice Assistant app or something like that. Well, it's it's called the uh, uh, speech to text, and I got it off uh, Amazon apps. Oh well, that won't work with. Okay, that'll only work with a Fire device. So you need no. to get you need to get it from the Android store on the device that you're using. If it's not a Fire device, if it's a Fire device, then I don't know. Then that's Amazon, and I and I really don't know. Amazon isn't real Android. They've taken Android and they've modified it dramatically. 
So I have no idea what's going on with Amazon. I don't have a, I don't see, let me see. I was pretty sure that every, I mean, what version uh, of Android I have here, because I was pretty sure that every Android device had dictation built into it. I'm kind of surprised that you can't just tap the microphone on the keyboard and uh, and dictate. Let me uh, just see here. I'll try. Uh, this is a this is a seven device, I think. Maybe they did. Maybe I don't see it. Maybe they did take it out. So uh, yeah, I'm afraid I don't have uh, I don't have any advice for you. Maybe somebody listening does. Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. Not sure what's going on there. To line two we go. April in Brooksville, Florida. Hi, April. Leo Laporte. Hi. Oh, hey, April. Hey. Hey. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing fine. What's up? I have a question. Mm hmm My husband wants to get a new router because our router is dropping us all the time. Oh, I hate that. You know, routers wear out. I think people assume it's a solid state. Why would it wear out? But after a few years, it's probably a good idea to get a new router. How old is that router? Um, Pretty old. Yeah, it's it's a couple of years old. Did it come from the internet service provider, or was it is it your device? No, we bought it from Walmart. Okay, well, I tell you, um, how big is your house? How many how many thousand square feet do you want to cover? Oh, only only thirteen hundred square okay. feet. We don't have a very big house. So, but you, my husband's biggest worry is that he doesn't want one made in China. He, my husband wears a tinfoil hat. <laughs> I don't know. That's going to be an interesting problem. How do you get? Uh, how do you? How do you know? Let me see. If uh, I'm looking at, yeah, this uh, I have an Eero, which is what I use at home, assembled in China. Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Of course, the company I was about to recommend, TP Link, is a Chinese company. So let's see. Tinfoil hat. Uh, is yeah, ta he, is he, Taiwan he, is Taiwan okay? It's not China. It's the Republic of China. It's not Chinese Communist. It's it's a it's a capitalist country. Is that okay? I, I it doesn't make a difference to me. But he well, I ask him if Taiwan is okay. It's not China. Okay. ASUS is a Taiwanese company that makes all of its stuff in Taiwan, and they're very good. ASUS. They're actually the routers I recommend. And because they're Taiwanese, Taiwanese companies and, and mainland China, they don't get along too well. Mainland okay. China doesn't like Taiwan. Taiwan says, don't call us Chinese. So uh, even though they speak Chinese and they're near China, they are not China. And they are, uh, Asus is an excellent company, and their routers are superb. So tell him, oh, no, honey, it's not made in China. It's made in Taiwan. <laughs> well, he just heard so many things about um, internet. Um, yeah, well, the U.S. Department of Commerce has actually recommended against Chinese networking equipment. So he's not wrong. He's not wrong. Uh, but Asus is not as far, you know, I'll have to check. But because they're a Taiwanese company, I bet you their stuff is made in Taiwan, not China. And I really love uh, their routers. That's an interesting, that's a very interesting question. Actually, so much of what we use today, if you get a Samsung phone, that's made in South Korea. Safer, right? iPhones are made in China, though. Assembled is a better word than made. Assembled. The parts come from all over, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Asus router had parts, some parts that were made in mainland China. But uh, I'm pretty sure it's assembled. I'd have to look on the box. But check that out. Check that out. And uh, are there any Korean manufacturers? Maybe. I don't think there are any routers made in the U.S. of A. I don't think so. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, Asus does have some manufacturing in China. Mostly Taiwan. Uh, and Mexico. And uh, I wonder if there if are routers made in Mexico. That's interesting. Everybody who uses passwords on the Internet, you know you need LastPass. 
man, I love LastPass. I started using LastPass practically when it was when it first came out. I remember, uh, you know, I was I was singing its praises to Steve Gibson. He said, "Well, we better check this." He got Joe Segrist, the creator of LastPass, to give him show him all excuse me show him all the source code, how everything worked, and Steve Gibson, our security guy, gave it his seal of approval, and he started using LastPass. We use LastPass. I've been using it personally, but we use LastPass at the business. That happened when an engineer, one of our engineers, couldn't remember all his passwords, so he created a public web page with all the logins to our web server, our all of our stuff, our, and put it on the public web. That's when we said, we got to have a better way. So we, we subscribed to LastPass Enterprise. You know, 81% of all the breaches, you know, the bad loss of data they're caused by weaker reused passwords reused is another big one and i understand you use the same password over and over again because you don't you can't remember a thousand passwords every website every app needs a password now who's going to remember so you use the same one you know your kids birth dates and your dog's name and you add maybe a little you know your initials right to make it secure that but the problem is you use that over and over again and if it, you know, Twitter has a breach, which they, you know, they said everybody has to change a Twitter password a month ago, then everywhere you used it, not just Twitter, has to be changed. You have to keep track of all that. How about this? Let's use a password vault that generates long, strong, unique passwords for every site. Passwords that you could never remember in a million years, but that's good because all you have to remember is your la the last password you ever have to remember, last pass, the password to your vault. Make that good, strong, okay? Don't don't give that to anybody, but you can write it down, put it in your desk drawer, that's fine. That's the password to get in your vault. All you need is that, and now it's the first thing I install on my phones, on my desktop, anywhere. When I set up a new system, the first thing I do is install a browser and then install the LastPass plugin so that I never have to remember any passwords. It's great for your business for easy onboarding, to password autofill, automated security reports, LastPass makes it easy for businesses to take control of passwords and reduce the threat of breach. Really is good. You have you can have levels of access. So we have a a, a, a folder in our LastPass enterprise just for the uh, engineers that need access to the servers. They're the only ones who have access to it. LastPass Enterprise simplifies password management for companies of every size with the tools you need to secure your business while centralizing control of employee passwords and apps. We use it. We recommend it. And by the way, I love it because it's part of our benefits to working here. Everybody gets a copy of LastPass for themselves. Each employee has their own secure vault for managing passwords. You can also, as the administrator of your enterprise account, send master password requirements. We require two-factor, for instance, which is a great thing. You can restrict access to specific devices and locations. When I was in Japan, I had to go to my LastPass vault log in, use the second factor, and say, yes, it's okay for me to use this in Japan. That's great. That means somebody logging in from overseas can't get into our LastPass because we say, no, you're in China. You can't access it. You can enable password resets. I see that every once in a while. I'll get an email. Russell, who administers it for us, I'll, we'll all get emails, all the administrators saying, hey, uh, Joe forgot his password. I like, I like knowing that. LastPass makes password sharing better, too. I, you know, Lisa and I are always sharing family passwords. We use LastPass to do that. Employees can do the same thing and yet keep your corporate data secure. Of course, LastPass is securely encrypted AES-256 to prevent man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, nobody, including LastPass, has access to your vault. Just you and the people you give access to it. If Look, if you want to take control of passwords... You got to do it, and whether it's at business level with the LastPass Enterprise or LastPass Premium for personal use, LastPass Families for the entire family, small team, LastPass for teams, 50 people or less, at work, at home, fix your password woes. If there's one thing I want you to do today to secure yourself, it's start using LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit today, lastpass.com slash twit. Check it out and see which product is right for you. And if you're a business and you're not using LastPass Enterprise, hurry. Because <laughs> it's only a matter of time before one of your engineers puts all the passwords up on a website because he can't remember them. LastPass.com slash twit. We thank them for their support of 
The Tech Guy Show. It's disco time with Disco Dick D. Bartolo. He's met. <laughs> is that Donna Summer? Hot it stuff? is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hot stuff for the summertime. Dick D. Bartolo's Mads Maddest writer. He has been for decades, but he's also a crazy gadget hound, a giz wizard, gizmo wizard or gizwiz in the parlance. And he joins us every week. Hello, Dickie D. Leo, how you doing? Do you know any routers not made in China? <laughs> uh, what is mine? I think uh, everything's made in China. No, my, mine is the Wonton 312. <laughs> <laughs> With six, you get egg roll. So that's yeah, exactly. Nice. Yeah. Exa yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So um, Dick joins us every week with a crazy gadget or gizmo. Yeah. What do you, what do you got this well, week? you know, I'm a little disappointed because someone in the chat room says Leah knows about this. So it was CE week in New York City, okay, uh, over at the Javits Center. So I found two gadgets, an expensive one and a cheap one. The one that I thought you were going to be thrilled about, the chat room says, you know about the digital license plate no about it i have one. Oh my gosh i was gonna you know what i said to the guy i said to dennis i said you know what i have to talk about this because right now it's only available in california right leo will be I, I okay we Did had you, him, we had him on the uh the new screensavers show it's kind of a kooky idea and uh, actually, I don't. I they offered me one, and I decided not to because you have a monthly subscription, <laughs> and I decided I didn't want to pay a monthly fee for my digital license plate. But Josh, who does the radio show website, uh, has one on his car, and it's kind of cool because it's e it's like e-ink technology, so it's very re readable and legible. They worked with the California Highway Patrol. It's going to be approved in other states soon, um, and you can have different messages on it, but only when you're yeah. parked. Yes, yes, and also it's seven hundred dollars, right? Six ninety nine. Yeah. Well, they were going to give it yeah. to me, but I, but I oh, still, okay. I thought, okay. yeah, no, I can't really see any advantage over the plain old metal license plate, at least for now. Yeah, they intended for fleets mostly. It has location, uh, a location device, and you can ch put the company's name on it. And stuff I also like, like it if your car is stolen, you can change the license plate to stolen. Isn't that funny? Yeah, I, th that's pretty neat. Yeah, in fact, that might be worth it. I know, that, car, and you can do Amber Alert. You know, you can yeah. do lot, lots of things on yeah. it. But but you're right. A lot of people that I told about it said, wait, I might pay 700 for the license plate. I'm not paying a monthly fee that was also. What, that was what got me. Yeah. It's a yeah. cool technology. Yeah, we had them on. It looks really, uh, really neat. And it would look nice on my Tesla since I already spent way too much money on that. Might well, well it doesn't look good on my boat. They'll say, why do you have a license plate? <laughs> you don't drive, do you? I don't. No, I don't. I said to the guy, I said, it's $700. I said, I'm in for another 40000 I have to buy a car to put it on. So, okay. Right. Well, then I will tell you about my flip shade. Do you know about that? I never heard of it. Good. Okay. Because it was introduced at, at CE Week and it it's, uh, goes on sale, uh, I, I think, this this very week. So my flip shade is from my charge. You know, the people who make uh, uh, all those external battery charges, yeah, yeah, phones. Yeah. So my flip shade is a little plastic shade that attaches to almost every iPhone. So it flips up and then it has fold out wings. This is great for the summer when you're trying to read your phone in the sun. You know, it'd be also good. I know Uber and Lyft drivers, uh, you know, they have their phone because that's the app. Yes. And I, I had an Uber driver who had a, a, a piece of cloth over his phone. I said, what are you doing? He said, it gets too hot in the sun. So this would be great for that because they could use that to protect it from the sun. Exactly. Yeah. And you can fold it over the back and use it as a stand. Uh, it oh. comes in. Black. It comes in uh, marble, and for some reason, it comes in pineapple. Okay, <laughs> not, not the color pineapple. It's a white cover with pictures of pineapples on it. Oh. But the neat thing, Leo, it's under ten bucks. Oh, so yeah, it's very clever. <laughs> and the little side, you see them. <laughs> it's a pineapple version. Yeah, exactly. And the little strange. side, little uh, side shades um, are clickable, so you can uh, raise and lower the shade, so you get the get the amount. It's for the of, beach. Uh, it's for the beach. There yeah. you go. The pineapple one is for the beach. Yeah, you go to the beach, uh, <laughs> and you got a, and it's only ten bucks. That's cool. It's ten bucks. Yeah, yeah. That's you. All, this is a perfect 
Gizwiz product. Gadget, exactly, Gadget. Yeah. exactly. Now it's it's just for iPhones. I said to the woman, nothing for Android. She said you could use it on your Android phone, but you might not be happy because it'll most likely cover your camera. <laughs> well, that's no so. good. <laughs> That's I said, no, that's okay. I said, I'll just start doing the Gizwiz as an audio podcast. <laughs> if you go to gizwiz.biz, that's Dick's website, G-I-Z-W-I-Z dot B-I-Z, and then, and then click on the Gizwiz Visits the Tech Guy, and you get links to the Neville R-Plate Pro electronic license plate, soon available in your state, or the $10 My Flip Shade, your choice. Yes, you should and also, no monthly fee. No monthly fee for the flip shade. You should also exactly. play the What the Heck Is It contest because that's also free and a chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. We're, we only got a little bit more time. Another week. Yeah, exactly. This week and next Saturday. And you'll be playing for the Hollywood edition of Mad Magazine. What? Me worry, says Alfred E. Newman as he <laughs> falls into the cement on Hollywood Boulevard. That's That's awesome. And you get that uh, autographed to you if you win, but you got to check it out. Read the rules at gizwiz.biz. He has a great podcast. You have a great podcast, my friend. It's called Thank The you, Gizwiz, sir. and you can find it at gizwiz.tv. Dickie D, thank you. Okay, buddy. I'll talk to you next week. Enjoy. How hot is it in New York? Uh, today, it's only 71. Oh, it's but, perfect. Uh, yesterday, it was uh, kind of I'm muggy. going to New York. It's 100 degrees here. It's crazy. Oh, 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 I thought you. Oh, I thought you said you were coming to New York. I wish okay. I were. You are Josh. We're coming okay. in December when it'll be nice and balmy. Oh yeah. I'm coming out. I got tickets to see Bruce Springsteen, and uh, and and I decided. I'm, well, as long as we're out there, I'm going to go see that Harry Potter and the. Oh yeah. And the, and the cursed child, or whatever it's called. It's two. Uh, it's so long. They split it in two. They say either watch it two nights in a row or get the matinee in the evening. So we got the matinee. We're gonna go to the matinee, have dinner, then watch part two that evening. Perfect. Is that nuts? Perfect. No, that's what people are doing. Yeah. Yeah. We'll meet for dinner. It was. Uh, they, we'll have a late lunch. Remember, there was uh, the mystery of Edwin Drood did the same thing. It was such a long. Yeah, Angels in America. Angels in America was split up. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you, Dickie D. Okay, buddy. I'll talk to you next week. Have a great okay. time. I got a minute left. Let's see if I can help Anna in Laguna Hills. It's going to be instant help. Hi, Anna. Hi, uh, Leo. Um, I was on Facebook this past weekend, and um, which I do about maybe every two, three months, you know, to check on the family. I clicked on the link, got the red screen on my computer with this blaring sound, finally disconnected and shut down my computer. But And I had the hardest time booting back up. But now what I notice is I can't access Google um, oh boy. from my computer. I, oh boy. I can go through the Internet Explorer, but Google Chrome does not, All right. does not Hang work. on the line because I want to help you with this. I don't know if you got malware. I'm going to have to ask you some more questions, or maybe you just need to reinstall Chrome. I'm hoping it's the latter. Uh, but we have to wrap it up. I want to thank Michael. Just so hang on. I'll help you off the air. Michael Cozio, our musical director. Kim Schaffer for answering the phones. Most of all, thank you for joining me. I'm Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great Geek Week. See you next time. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon. This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time. Sorry, Anna. Wow, that's yeah. not good. So let's see here. Um, you clicked a link in Facebook, and what did the blaring red sign say? with the phone number that my computer was compromised. Yeah. Security was... That's bogus. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Uh, that's trying to get you to call them so that they can infect your computer and take your money. <laughs> uh, although, you know, on, on the taskbar on the right side of my computer, there is this flag and it has a message. It says, solve PC issues. Okay. I so that know. is real. That's from Microsoft. That's yeah. the Microsoft Security Center. So the thing you saw 
um, is something that uh, kind of scammers try to get on your system so that you'll call them. I'm glad you didn't you didn't call the number, right? No, no, yeah, I yeah. didn't. I'm glad you had the sense not to call the number because <laughs> that's just them trying to get some money out of you. And sometimes they actually, you know, they'll ask for remote access. Uh, they'll say for a few hundred dollars we can fix this problem. They'll make mm -hmm. up a bunch of problems. They'll, they'll have you go through some steps that make it look like you've got problems, even though you don't. Mm -hmm. And then they'll ask you for money. And yeah. sometimes during the remote access part of the call, they can actually put stuff on your computer. So never call those numbers. Oh yeah. And those pop-ups are easy to do on websites. It's a little unusual. I've never heard it happening if you're actually on Facebook, but you might have had another website in the background, or maybe you clicked a link in Facebook that took you outside to an outside. Yes, it, it did. It had something to do with uh, America got, has talent or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it looked interesting. It was a I scam. Said, okay, I'll click on that. Yeah. So, but no harm done. Yeah. As long as you're using, are you using Windows 10? Um, no, I'm at seven. Seven's fine, yeah. and you're but you keep it up to date, right? You've got all the updates. Uh, the automatic updates. Beautiful, yeah. and yeah. your and your browser you said was IE eleven. That's good. So yeah. you keep it all up to date. That as long as you're up to date, the chances are they weren't able to get anything in your system. They have to get you to agree to install something. Oh, okay. So you're probably all right. Now I would check that. Click that flag. And see what the troubleshooter, that actually is Microsoft. That's safe to click mm -hmm. in the system tray. Uh, that's going to launch the security center. And they, they may say, sometimes they say stupid things like, well, you don't have an antivirus or you haven't backed up in a while. Stuff like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But see mm -hmm. if they offer any sensible uh, information. They may have some simple fix. Chrome, when you launch Chrome, you, you said you can run IE, but you can't launch Chrome. What happens when you run it? Okay, uh, when I click on Chrome, uh, it just gives me a blank white screen. Okay. And then every once in a while, um, the, a new tab pops up. But then within 30 seconds, it like right now, I tried it, uh, and it says uh, restore pages. Chrome, Chrome didn't shut down correctly. That's fine. Uh, and then within 30 seconds, it drops, and it's gone. That's normal. That's Chrome. Um but you but you say even if you try to load another page, it won't open. Um, and then the cursor just stops. I mean, it freezes. And the page drops. It's gone. Um, and, you know, Google is, uh, Chrome is gone. So it sounds like Chrome is crashing. It's possible that at some point you have installed something that is a Chrome extension or a browser hijacker that is causing issues with Chrome. Mm -hmm. So um, one way to see if this is the case is to launch Chrome in what we call safe mode, uh, which will not, inst will not launch any of these extra doohickeys, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of, let's see, how can we do this uh, easily? Um, Uh, I'm, I'm going to, I don't want to do a complicated thing because <laughs> one I'm, way to do I'm, it is, is to, is to, is to change the, can you hold down a key? Um, I'm really know. a novice. Yeah, that's fine. And I, and I'm glad you called <laughs> and I think you're probably okay. Um, if you can launch it in safe mode, you know all that. I'm I'm looking for the easy way to do this. There's yeah. a harder way to do it that is kind of annoying, where you have to change the the shortcut. But there should uh, if so. You say this Chrome closes entirely. You can't get to the menu icon at all. Right. So yeah, we want to do it with the launch. Used to be you could hold the shift key, but I don't think that works anymore. Let me see. Is it shift launch? Does that work still, bleep blurb? I'm, I'm looking at our chat room. See if they, uh, they can do this. Because you can do it from the menu, but you can't even get the menu. So I want to... Right. I want to... Uh, yeah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it from the menu. I want to do it when you're launching to me. Control shift Chrome, they're saying. Let me, let me try this myself. To see if that works. Control Shift and then launch Chrome. Uh, yes. I don't know 
if that, what does that do, control shift? Okay, so do you want to allow the following program to make the change? Yeah, that's normal, yeah. And see if that does that. And then see if it will launch. Okay. Okay, I get the tab with, uh, it says restore, because it didn't shut down. Yeah, don't click restore, just cancel that out. Because you don't want to restore that bad page. Right. See, now, now it freezes. It's again. just frozen. Yeah. Yeah. Chrome, Chrome not responding. Chrome is not responding. Yeah. So um, probably it would be sufficient for you to uninstall Chrome and reinstall it. Okay. Um, what happened is when you clicked the link, it launched Chrome... It launched a tab in Chrome, and that was that malware thing. Uh, and it screwed something up in Chrome. And what I want to be, if we could launch Chrome in safe mode, it's such a pain in the butt to do it. But, how do um, I do that? I'm looking. Troubleshoot Chrome. Fix next, fix problem apps, fix problems, cross off, fix problem apps. When is good? More. Yeah, see, it, all, of the, all of the reset commands require Chrome to be open. And since you can't yeah. even get to it to be open, <laughs> right. that's right. a little bit uh, trickier. Yeah. Um, and that's why I want to start it in safe mode. I used to be able to do that. Well, I guess what you need to do is to go, if you, if you um, hit the Windows key and type uninstall, you'll see Add Remove Programs, and you can actually remove Chrome. Okay. I think that's in my control panel. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a control panel. Okay. And then, um, yeah, the, all of the solutions, unfortunately, require you to have Chrome running, which is silly because what you need is a solution that will prevent Chrome from starting up with this. Mm -hmm. And then, unfortunately, Chrome saves its user data. Boy, this should not be so hard. That is, this is this is really ridiculous. On an Internet Explorer, you just hold down the Shift key. It looks like Chrome has made this more difficult than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Chrome user data. Hmm. Oh boy. Oh boy, there's a folder that does store that has the information that will not be removed when you uninstall, unfortunately. Um, and it's complicated, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. to find it and delete it. I, there's a lot of commands, and I'm not sure. I understand, you know, this, this is yeah. tricky for you. I, I would hate to lose whatever. Well, you won't lose anything in in your, but you have to browse to your username, app data, local Google Chrome user data. Oh. <laughs> it's ba it's way down in your operating system. There's a folder uh, that has all of this stuff. Somewhere in that folder, there's something that is keeping Chrome from launching. There's a messed oh. up page. Mm -hmm. And what we'd like to do is delete it. Um, there is a, okay, one more option here from Bleeping Computer, which is, by the way, a great site for you to know about. Bleeping, oh, okay. Bleepingcomputer.com. It's a, it's a help site. They offer a Chrome cleanup tool. That, and this is, a, this is a reliable site. And the cleanup tool is written by Google that will scan your computer for problems in Chrome. So this actually is probably exactly what you want. Okay. Now to get to it is a little long, complicated thing. You probably could Google bleeping computer, one word, Yeah. and Chrome cleanup tool. Okay. And it, it, I think that would be enough to find it. Uh, you, you, use, you obviously have to use Internet Explorer to do this. Right. <laughs> But if you can find that tool and download it, get it from Bleeping Computer, mm -hmm. and you run it, and that should get rid of whatever this is that's causing Chrome a problem. And you may at that point want to uninstall and reinstall Chrome. All right. Okay. 
Uh, it, it, I, it's my belief that your system is not infected. But if, but so this should be enough to do it. But it's probably not a bad idea to uh, run a system scan just in case. Okay. Uh, and that's under that flag. Right. So you might you might write that. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Well, Leo, thank you. I am sorry. This is way this is way too complicated. <laughs> this really shouldn't be so complicated. And buy mm -hmm. in so when you buy your next computer, get uh, a Chromebook instead of a Windows machine. I'm sorry. Get a get a what? It's something called a Chromebook. It does. It's not Windows. It's it's Chrome OS. It's much more secure. Much safer. Mm -hmm. much more reliable. And if what you do is you just use the web, you get email, you keep an eye on the family at Facebook, stuff like that. It's much safer, much less likely to have security issues. Mm. I, I heard you talk about Lenovo earlier. Lenovo's good, but Windows, the problem is that people buy Macs and Windows, they buy these general purpose, elaborate operating systems, which you know some people need if you're launching rockets or designing bridges or mm -hmm. editing video. But mm -hmm. for most people, they're just surfing the web, getting email, shopping, stuff like that. Yeah. A simpler system that's more secure would be better. And that's mm -hmm. the that's the Chromebook, it's called. Okay. They're does not that, expensive. Does that have the Word application? Because I do use that quite a bit. Well, it has Google's own uh, word processing is built into it and stores it in the Google Cloud. Um, and you can use Microsoft Word on the web. So, but it does not offer the Microsoft Office download. Oh. Okay. But if you do, you need all those features. You may, I mean, people use Word because, but they may not need everything. Are you writing? Not everything. Yeah. Every once in a while, I use Excel. But yeah, there's a spreadsheet. Google has a free, a word processor spreadsheet, uh, uh, programs on Google Drive that are really. It's called Google Docs. They're quite good. Mm -hmm. They come with the Chromebook. I bet you it has all the features you'd ever need. Oh, okay. You never have to worry about backup. You never have to worry about viruses. You know, you click a link like this, and there's a there's a setting called Power Wash. You run it, and everything's back to normal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really... The problem is that, uh, you know, we all bought Windows because that's what you bought. Yes. But you kind of had to become a, as you see, you have to kind of become an, a security expert. <laughs> right. And who wants to do that? I know. I know. I don't have the time for no. that. No. <laughs> I'm retired. I'm Ain't nobody got time for that, Anna. <laughs> so next computer, get a Chromebook. Yes. Um, I, I think I will. All right. Leo, I appreciate so much your help, and I, I totally enjoy your show oh, every week. You're wonderful. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate Th thanks, it. Thanks, Leo. All right. Thanks. Have a good day. I'm sorry thanks this happened you. to you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, I just, I feel for people who, if you don't have a family member like me, you know, somebody who can come in and fix all this stuff, you're just out of luck. You know, what do you do? I can't tell her, well, go to percent app data percent slash you can't, can't tell her to do that you know open the command line and there should be a, it should have been an easier way to to do, launch chrome in safe mode the fact that you can't do that is really annoying they used to have a shortcut for it yeah but i don't you know it's none of these are easy if you if chrome's not working you know, then you have to launch it with the command line dash dash incognito mode. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell Anna, okay, right click on the icon and go to properties and look at the command line and add space dash dash incognito dash mode to the command line. I mean, I'm not going to tell her to do that. It's just not right.